All right, Elizabeth, we uh, ready to round two? Well, that was a, a nice lunch and about the right level where hopefully um, uh, everyone's still uh, relatively attentive here. We can have a, a productive afternoon as we, uh, as we go forward. Well, while we spent the morning trying to lay some of that foundation, uh, what we want to start off now is, is talking about as we start thinking about these new product opportunities in a little bit more detail, uh, what are some of the things that we might want to try and, and keep top of mind? And a number of uh, the comments through the morning talked about target customer segments and who are we thinking about. And while there's, there's uh, uh, certainly more uh, work to be done, and I just might point out, Elizabeth, you've done a lot of thinking on those customer segments for your marketing activities and segmentation, and so there's a lot of that work that's, that's in place uh, already. Um, but um, let me just talk a little bit about some of the priorities that we might think about. Uh, we've, we've talked a fair amount already about um, uh, considering some of the younger visitors, the Gen Xers, the Millennials, and making sure that Estes Park uh, stays relevant in future years. Uh, at our table at lunch, we were talking about we need to do that and make sure that we're not alienating our, our bread and butter, or the, the boomer segment. And so that can be a, 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 a little bit of a challenging uh, balancing act, but very important that we're thinking about new products, new uh, issues. Are there certain younger segments that we want to particularly focus on and think about are some of these product concepts really going to resonate and speak with some of these younger audiences? Boy, you know, I, I heard this loud and clear, um, and it's all about off-season and shoulder season and, and not so much how do we build more visitation when there's no room at the inn, um, but uh, how do we build demand. And so thinking about products that um, are less weather dependent, that we can uh, have activities in the, in the fall uh, and, and winter uh, months. Um, how do we convince more of these existing visitors that um, they need to extend their stay. How do we capture them? How do we tell them this broader mix of experiences? Think back to my Indiana Dunes example, and they're, they're coming to the lakeshore, but let's let us serve and, and show how you can take this nature-based experience, and, and there's so much more that you most of you don't, don't know anything about, and let us make it easy for you to, to understand that, uh, that experience. Um, there was some talk, um, and I, I think there needs to be more talk, about regional thinking. And while uh, it's most important that Estes Park uh, gets its act together internally and, and moves this uh, uh, movement uh, forward, we also have to be thinking about are there, are there regional opportunities where we think beyond uh, the bookends of Estes Park and think about linking and integrating uh, other regional products and, and think about using Estes Park, and, and I think Elizabeth, you, you say base camp is, is a term you guys uh, use pretty frequently, but that, that um, when we were working in, in Williamsburg um, in, in Virginia, um, they lost that identity as the base camp. The, the families weren't coming to Williamsburg and basing their Virginia visit out of Williamsburg. They shifted to Virginia Beach, and they'd make their day trip over to Williamsburg and do their history and heritage um, so a lot of this is, th there may be these regional products, but how do you convince that visitor that they need to uh, base their stay, base their, their, their experience in Estes Park? And certainly, um, I, I was mentioning in, in Asheville, one of their key considerations was you've, you've, you've got to uh, demonstrate how you're going to generate incremental room nights. And that brings in more money, tax implications, and, and all that. That, that was a, a really a centerpiece of um, some of their criteria. So not that this is the, the final ones, but as we, we break and we start thinking about different uh, options, I'm gonna challenge you. Think about, does it speak to some of the young, younger markets? Does it have the opportunity to transition some of the day visits into longer stay visits? Uh, is it uh, generating off or shoulder season uh, demand? Is, are there regional uh, opportunities? So keep some of those kinds of, of thoughts uh, top of mind. Um, one of the other things when um, Elizabeth went out and uh, did the partner survey, they also asked uh, what types of products, activities, or amenities do they think are desired. 
So let me go through some of these um, examples. Again, not that they're right or wrong, but just to, again, prime the pump a little bit as we break into some of our groups. Historical designation and tours, uh, zip lines, bunny slopes, adventure park, Elkhart, uh, Elkhorn uh, Lodge redevelopment, epic and wellness center completion, uh, more winter activities to offset slow season, um, support financially if necessary to drive and make Estes Park a state arts district, uh, parking, and that came across numerous times, downtown parking garage, events that would bring a younger crowd and would encourage overnight stays, kiosks downtown to show our visitors uh, where things are located. Again, outdoor adventure park, water trails, white water park, connected trail system, um, working with businesses on developing destination wellness, uh, a large winter ice play area, having curling lanes, open skating and ballroom or broom ball, um, also a winter play area sledding, snowboarding. This one was interesting where they were talking about, and what if we connected local microbrewers and, and vendors at the base? So we, we made this active, vibrant uh, type of, uh, of, of area. A community-wide shuttle system in operation for more weeks of the year. Uh, and then there were uh, a large number of, of comments about destination wellness and sports medicine being a natural fit with our clean environment and challenging terrain, perfect for trail running, rock climbing, uh, et cetera. Um, so what we're, we'll be doing is you know, trying to take some of these ideas, other ideas that, that you have as, as we break into uh, some groups. I don't want to get into discussions on this right now. We'll be doing that as the afternoon progresses. But let me just touch on a, a, a couple of, of other destinations and how they've uh, approach some things. Um, there were quite a number of comments about arts and, and culture and, and how do we make that more deep and, and uh, engaging uh, within Estes Park. And uh, one of the things that I, I think is, is really important is that uh, we get away from thinking of it just as a static viewing experience. So thinking about the galleries and, and, and art in that kind of context. And Galena is a, is a great uh, little community in Northwest uh, Illinois. Um, and I really love the way they characterize their arts and culture, the, the feel of their, um, of their um, uh, town as it related to their Galena Artist Studios. Galena is a wonderful place where artists come to be inspired and to flourish. We hope you enjoy our collective talents. So it's all about coming to the destination to release your inner artist. You're, you're, you're not coming just to be a passive viewer. You're, you're being engaged. You've got studios, you've got activities where you can, um, and it relates to this wellness theme about how do I um, uh, bring out some of this artistic capabilities and that this destination um, helps me um, uh, in, in that kind of regards. Uh, Door County in Wisconsin has done the same thing with their Peninsula School of, of Art. Santa Fe does the same thing with cooking and their culinary academy where you're coming not to only to, to eat great culinary dinners, but also to, to learn from some of the, the chefs in terms of uh, cooking and, and preparing some of the great Southwestern dishes. So when we're thinking about new arts and culture opportunities, thinking about how we can do that, not just again from a, from a passive viewing kind of context, but where we're really engaging that visitor and giving them a, a way to experience that, that art and culture for themselves. And it doesn't have to be in a, in a large city or a large community. This is a tiny little town on the Canadian border in, in Washington State. And what they did was um, convert their old city hall uh, to, a, to an art center. Uh, the Jensen Art Center, it was financed, uh, it was the city building, but they had a benefactor, of, it was a trucking company that grew up in, in this small community, and he uh, funded this new art center. And it has all of these great breakout rooms for ceramics, for painting, for jewelry, for textiles. And so as, as visitors come in, they're engaged. They've got this great, where there's some great art to, to look at and sculpture, they also can be immersed in, and participate. And this little town doesn't have anything like Estes Park in terms of the setting, the environment, and this whole kind of concept of uh, wellness and, and, um, uh, and uh, experiences. So really thinking about how do we engage that visitor, how do we take that art and culture that make it something where they can participate and, and be part of that process. 
Um, some of you, has anyone heard the term geotourism? Um, well, that and, and also um, connecting different thematic areas. Uh, Geo, uh, National Geographic coined this uh, a few years back, and they argued that, that we're doing ourselves a disservice by uh, putting our, our visitors in silos. This is a cultural visitor, and this is an outdoor recreation enthusiast, and this is a, a, a culinary visitor. And in reality, that, that person who's out for a, a great uh, run on a, on a trail is looking for a, a fa fantastic dinner uh, later in the day and also the, the next day to be able to go see some type of neat art uh, exhibit. And we really need to be thinking about how um, these pieces interact. And one of the things I think about this kind of a, a body or, or entity, uh, too often the people from these different thematic disciplines never talk, never interrelate, never think about how does that outdoor forest ranger talk to the, the art uh, person or, or, or talk to the uh, wellness uh, or, or the chef. And that's where some of these integrated um, experiences can come, come about. So when we talk about art or culture or those kinds of, of things, keep geotourism and think about how these different pieces fit together and are there thematic ways um, and, and uh, you know, building off um, the, the whole uh, wellness idea. I think there's so many different components where outdoor recreation and, and, and foods, uh, arts, uh, can all be wrapped under that kind of a, of a wellness umbrella and, and opportunities to link and integrate those in uh, new and meaningful kinds of ways. Um, when we talk about uh, the trails and, and making them more engaging and fun, think about, and somebody, when we were talking about the, the river and, and talking about is there ways to, to link um, sculptures and, and art pieces, interpretation elements. And so it's a great trail system, but there's also other elements that make that more engaging, more um, experiential, uh, that you, you really wake that up and make that experience deeper and richer. So thinking about not just getting uh, a trail on a map, but how do we link some of the other capabilities in the town and, and cross-fertilize some of these experiences and opportunities. And sometimes sign ordinances and, and issues that you're um, uh, limited by, um, people want to interpret, people want to understand the deeper story, the deeper meaning, and oftentimes that can be done in in uh, a quality kind of way. It, it doesn't have to be uh, a detracting element to an environment or, or a, a, an area. And so how do we help that visitor understand, interpret, experience some of those areas and use uh, some of these uh, components in, uh, in again, a, a, a well-positioned uh, and, and quality kind of environment or, or setting? Oftentimes also when we're talking about um, making that storyline uh, more deep and, and resonate more with, uh, with a visitor. Um, the opportunity for electronically, there's so much we can do on, on that front where whether it's an outdoor recreation experience, an art uh, experience, uh, downloadable uh, podcasts, and I know the, the park has some of it and as Yellowstone, Denali, and, and lots of the others, I don't think the park is, is the, the ultimate in, in terms of execution on that, but there's lots of, of great ways where uh, somebody was talking about a, an art circuit or, or telling a, an art story. And, and again, if that could be melded with the artist talking about the inspiration and what drove him and how he started this and, and brought this back, you make that experience so much deeper, so much richer and the amount of cost and, and, and efforts. And some of these things from a product, it's absolutely product development, and it's, it's product that's here, but you're, you're bringing it up to a whole new level. You're, you're making it much more visible. You're adding the backstory to, uh, to the experience. Lots of opportunities uh, along that uh, lines and, and bringing more of the electronic uh, capability to uh, some of that. So um, I think we've, we've talked a fair amount as far as existing products in terms of SWAT factors, in terms of critical issues, and you know, some examples of, of product kinds of ideas. And so now what we really want you to do is, is go to work. Um, so what we're gonna do is break out into, um, let's see, probably um, seven groups, I think. Um, and 
um, we've got seven tables. Each of the tables uh, sit 10 people. And what we're going to ask you to do is uh, take some time and talk about some of the prospective products that resonate with you, that you've heard, that, that has bubbled up, that you think hold uh, potential and, and opportunity. But let me add to that, what I'd also like you to do is um, talk about why you think that that should rise to a priority type of product. Does it hit some of the, the weaknesses or, or some of the deacceleration that, that one of you guys uh, coined? Um, are, are there ways where it's targeting some of our, our target customer segments and, and building uh, overnights or uh, building sh uh, shoulder season? So talk about different product ideas, talk about different uh, concepts, but also force yourself to talk about, you know, does this idea rise and does it uh, address some of the, the things that we've talked about as we've gone through uh, the morning? And then secondly, once a, an idea or a concept uh, has been uh, identified, uh, take just a, a couple of minutes and talk about are there certain factors that could either be uh, supportive of making that move, that project or that concept move forward, or conversely, are there issues that would make this uh, difficult to, to move forward? It might have been a product that's been on the drawing board but just can't uh, seem to get any momentum because of X, Y, and Z. So product ideas, rationale for why that should rise to a, a higher priority, uh, and what uh, are some of the, the factors that could either support or restrict advancement of those concepts. So what we uh, are gonna do, um, I'm gonna have you count off um, and then break into one of seven groups and we're gonna take about 45 minutes and have some of your discussion in the, in the group uh, setting. And what I'd like um, is to have uh, one person at each of the table agree to take some notes uh, from the dialogue and discussion and then what we'll, we'll do is, uh, is regroup and have each of the groups report back a little bit in terms of the ideas. And then that way, all of us can have the benefit of the different thinking and, and the different ideas and concepts that have come up uh, with the different breakout uh, sessions. So that make sense, Elizabeth? Um, so why don't, um, Tina, I'm gonna have you start off and we'll have you one, two, two. Okay, what we're, what we're going to start uh, doing here is having each of the, the groups report back and, and summarize uh, some of the, the ideas, the concepts, the, the issues, and sort of as we, we talked about, are there some ideas that seem to, to resonate within your group? And then particularly, was there some rationale for some of the priorities and what it, it addressed and some of the, the things that we, we discussed and talked about? Uh, this morning. So maybe I'll, I'll pick on, I'm not quite sure who was one, twos, or threes, but uh, let's, let's start logically here and, and go with, with group one. Who was in group one? All right, and John, are you going to do the reporting back? I am. All right, uh, with, with <laughs> I catch you with that nice big bite of brownie, huh? So one of the obstacles for our group was eating that last bell. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, we went around the table. Um, we started off talking about distilleries, breweries, and wineries. Uh, we thought this would attract a younger generation. It's something that's already going on. We thought one component to add to that would be tr transportation, transit. That's a good uh, obviously point, yeah. for public safety reasons and it also makes for a better guest experience if they're going multiple places and it's more of a special event. Um, we felt that it also had kind of an educational component. People are engaged in learning about how uh, how something is made and that gets them excited. Um, we didn't really hit on any particular obstacles except I know that uh, finding commercial property that is code compliant and that type of thing has been an obstacle for some of the folks trying to do that. Uh, the next item we talked about was the proposed uh, community center. Um, there was a feeling that it needed to be discussed more in the community, that it would help us uh, serve working age families, families with children, uh, would also help with uh, jobs. 
there's a little bit of back and forth as to whether that's really destination product development or not. Yeah, but and that, that was going to be one of the, the comments. And I, I think as we go through this, what I'd like to do is as John mm -hmm. gives some of these ideas, if, if there's any other thoughts or weighing in that we all sort of benefit from, well, the, the focus was within the, the smaller group. Um, so let me go back and, and as you, you sure. go through, but the, the thought with the, the breweries, the, the, the wineries uh, integrating that, I'll go back to that Asheville example. They were voted um, brew capital of the of the country uh, two years, three years ago, um, and it it, it aghast uh, Washington and, and Oregon that here North Carolina is, is taking this this title. But I think you, you you're right on in terms of speaking to some of those younger segments, uh, really integrating with outdoor recreation once once they've they've had a, a great workout and, and getting back, uh, a really good idea. Uh, other ideas or, or thoughts uh, when, when John brings up that, that general idea of, of the brew pubs and, and going deeper and deeper in, in that area? It does, and, and there's some nat natural uh, uh, connections that, that can make uh, uh, some great sense and um, a, a good idea. And I, I also think the, um, the community center, that's, that's a good point. Is it, is it really that external visitor or, or the, the internal resident? And sometimes, is there a way that it could be crafted where it did speak to both audiences? And, and I guess I would add to that that I know one of the revenue streams they want to project is, is out-of-town visitors. Well, and, and that oftentimes can be a, a key element in operating costs and, and uh, making it more financially uh, feasible. And are there ways you, you can bring some of those external visitors uh, in? Adam, did you have a point? No, actually, John just said. Oh, that. okay. Yeah. Adam, tell them about the barrel. That fits in very nicely. Yeah, so one, one of the things that's happening is on the um, land where the performing arts center is going. One of the things that's happening is on the uh, pad downtown where the Performing Arts Center is going to be built. Um, we were requested by a, uh, a local group of people um, to utilize that empty space now that is having no uh, revenue created on it, prime downtown location. Um, they asked if they could put a beer garden on that space until the groundbreaking for the Performing Arts Center. Mm, yeah. um, so they just had their Board of Adjustments meeting, and the Board of Adjustments went ahead and, and approved them. Um, they'll be going for their liquor license and, and so on and so forth. So that's another opportunity um, to utilize a space that is not creating any revenue for right, a so nice interim use outdoor, and, uh, exactly, sure. multi-use, family use. Um, so they're doing uh, some renovations. It's going to have a front entrance and a back entrance from, from the back parking lot and things like that. Uh, they're concentrating on microbrews and, and Colorado craft beers. Uh, so they'll have, I think, about 30, Jim, is that right? About 30 taps. Um, so that's, that's another exciting thing that goes hand in hand with the, with the breweries. John or Adam, did, was there any discussion of uh, entertainment elements that could be potentially associated with? Absolutely, uh, because, because it's eventually going to be a performing arts center, we want to tie in live music. Um, there is some of that downtown now. There's a, a, a spot called Barlow Plaza in between Mama Rose's and Poppy's Pizza, where during the summer they'll have somebody come in there and, and set up on a, on a stool or chair and play live music. Um, nothing loud, no, no rock bands and things uh -huh. like that. But um, yeah, absolutely. Good. So I think we, we talked about the community center. Um, another priority would be growing event center business. Uh, the town has already built this new facility. Uh, there's, it's staffed, it, you know, they're trying to fill it with events and that can become a real centerpiece for indoor events, which means they don't have to be limited to good weather. They can be year round events. Um, there was some discussion of what types of events and uh, the Stanley Hotel had an extremely successful band event this past weekend right. and the band has their own following so they basically sold it out two months ago um, versus sometimes if someone's trying to launch a new festival are they going to be able to identify and bring their own market so part of it is thinking about for the types of events we bring which ones bring in a built-in audience versus what do you have to build and grow and try, how do you assess that I might um, just bring up a, a, a point uh, along that lines with um Sedona, one of the challenges they had with their performing arts 
with some of the um, uh, musician restrictions in terms of uh, mileage between, so if they were playing in, in Phoenix or Scottsdale, they, they couldn't play up in Sedona, and so many of the ones that they had hoped to, that they, they didn't have the radius and just another factor or issue that had to and, be considered. <clears throat> We've looked at that, and, and it's interesting because we are dead center between Denver and Cheyenne, Wyoming. So that uh, touring bands and groups and, and philharmonics and things like that can actually stop in Estes Park on their way back and forth from oh, one fantastic. to the other. Yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, the next thing we talked about was existing trail systems for both walking and biking. Uh, obviously, flood recovery has been an issue in some places, especially along Fish Creek Corridor. But uh, if we had uh, better signage, if we had more of an integrated system, um, we could have, there's been the concept of the rec center of, around Lake Estes of having workout stations. Um, uh, some time ago, um, we had partnered with the town to file for a uh, art place grant to create a plain air trail out on the knoll property. Hmm. And the concept is to have five or six stations on the knolls looking at the Stanley Hotel, wow. Long's Peak, the Continental Divide, looking out over downtown, Mount Olympus, uh, Lumpy Ridge, and ex tell people what they're looking at. But those could be stations that could be used by artists, photographers, historical tours, performers, um, poets. Yeah, Jim is a... Uh, in, as a historian laureate, he wants to promote uh, a poet laureate. Um, but there's also been folks who are working on having 10 to 12 different stations in downtown and Stanley Village that would be more focused on live street performances. So if we can somehow pull that whole concept together, it, it won't cost a great deal of money to create these stations or market them, but it will help uh, integrate that and also the idea of tying those into events so that people are walking from place to place and it's kind of pulling everything together outdoors which kind of fits our theme. A, a couple of, of points on that I, I think you, you really hit on an important element there where you know relatively moderate costs to implement that and the ability to put some of those stories and whether it's podcasts and electronics whether it's some of the, the, the graphic uh, uh, placards that we were uh, talking about, lots of different ways that that can be executed with a, with a limited uh, amount of money. On, on, the, on the events um, that you were, were talking about, did you get much into discussion? You know, part of that, that caveat is, and, and somebody brought this up earlier today, but just really thinking about um, not just that it, it's another event, but is it an event that speaks to um, a particular customer segment that we're looking for or that can build demand in, in off season? Were there any thoughts in specific themes or, or ideas? Uh, you know, between those two, we didn't go too deep, but yep. I guess, you know, we have a lot of existing events that are either arts or creative focused that if you kind of had this state concept of having different stations, it would get people moving around downtown. Uh, sometimes the downtown retailers are less than thrilled at some of the events because they feel all the activities in one space and it doesn't really help their business. But if, if you're thinking customer centric, not, not retailer centric, and the point is how are we making this experience, I'll harken back to, uh, to Asheville, crazy. The, the, the drum circles, you, you guys have seen, that's one of the most popular, and these are impromptu, almost no, no cost, but it's engaging, it's fun, it's experiential, and it, it really speaks to exactly what you're, you're talking about there. Uh, the next thing we talked about was the Wellness Summit, which is coming up in April. Uh, the idea is, uh, as the Wellness Center comes online, how can we get our existing businesses to be part of that community-wide brand? Um, one of the interesting stories I heard, uh, Phil Tulin, who likes to go around and kind of promote his website, had talked to someone about wellness who had uh, one of the old-time, you know, uh, Western wear photo shops. You go in and you put on a cowboy hat. Right, or, yeah. um, and he said, well, you probably couldn't really do anything for wellness. And he said, you know what, if somebody came in and did a before photo, then six months later they'll come back, I'll give them a free photo. <laughs> 
of the after photo. And so there are creative ways for businesses to take advantage of that That's that are good. not That's necessarily really costly. They're relatively cheap promotions. And we saw the biggest barrier to that is, you know, will you get enough participation from the businesses? Will they be engaged enough? Well, and, and that really requires this kind of group to get some of the momentum. And what I've found is once you get that ball rolling, it's not so much how do we get them engaged, it's um, don't leave me out. Um, when they see some of the progress, some of the other uh, compatriots making progress. And so it, it takes a, a group like this to get that ball rolling, get some excitement, get some, some buzz uh, going. And then all too often they're, they're as I say, afraid to be left out. Uh, another area was Rocky Mountain National Park and outdoor activities, primarily on winter activities. How can we package them? How can we target that existing market for people who are attracted to those kinds of activities? Um, one potential obstacle is just getting um, accommodations, other businesses interested in doing packages and really being engaged in the marketing. I mean, this is something Visit Estes Park is doing now, but well, you can always use more of it. Is, is there much that is occurring today with that, that winter activity or experiences with, with the park? Yes, um, cross country skiing, cross country skiing, um, snowshoeing, back country skiing. We're yep, starting yep, to dabble sure, in sure, a little yep. more, even though it's limited. Um, really, just celebrating everything there is to do in Estes from in the winter, which really lends opportunity to the spas we have in town and the hiking groups we have in town. The mountain shop um, rents out every type of equipment you would need to do some of these winter activities, um, and then the events round that out nicely. So. I think that's the intent, is to add events during the winter season as well. That, that has an, intrigues me. I was in uh, Methal Valley uh, a few weeks ago in, in Washington State Center, uh, northern part, um, next to, to Mount Baker. But they build themselves as the largest contiguous uh, mix of, of Nordic um, uh, ski spots. And it's really been amazing what they've been able to use that as a, as a lever of building. You know, summer's still their, their, their peak time, but they've really been able to, to round that, uh, that out. And just with the connection with the park and being able to, to use that as a marketing um, a pitch, it, it, it's a pretty intriguing uh, uh, avenue in my mind. So I yeah, think... Yeah, sorry. Do you want to summarize we have similar discussions? Or... Uh, no, absolutely. I'm sorry. I, I want to... Um, our group also talked about leveraging existing activities, resources um, in that sort of recreation field, especially in the winter. Um, you know, leveraging Eldora for those that do want to ski. Um, I think um, Kay was saying that they are very successful in communicating that it's only an hour away, setting those expectations that it's not right there, but that if you want a day of skiing, it's very accessible. The rentals here in town are, are very reasonable. You can get them the night before and you can have breakfast on the way and that it is really an enjoyable experience um, and more affordable than staying in a resort town um, as far as actual resort skiing. But then we also talked about how can we break down the barriers to entry to some of these other sports? And I know these discussions have been happening throughout the community in the sports, fitness, recreation realm um, for multiple sports, um, trail running, racing, um, running racing, road cycling, mountain biking, all of these. But how do we break down those barriers? And a lot of that is you know, just providing the information in a really simple way. Um, so you know, having the, an easy packet that maybe a lodge owner or front desk person can print out that says, here's where you go to rent your snowshoes, here's where you go to snowshoe the best trails, here's some events or ranger programs around snowshoeing that you can engage in. Um, but just kind of making it, spoon feeding that information to people to break down that barrier to entry because it can be very intimidating if you've never done it before. Um, and that's true for cross country skiing, back country skiing, if you're a skier but you've just never gone out in the back country, how do I, how do I find that path to that activity? 
Um, we also talked about the limits that we end up having with wireless um, as far as there's a lot of apps that could facilitate that, whether it's a running route or a snowshoe location or those types of things that you may or may not be able to use in particular locations or your service may not be as good at certain times of the year. If you come in July and you want a running route and you want to track it with your Fitbit, is there enough wireless, not wireless internet per se, but like 3G you know, phone connection to be out there engaging with those activities, with those apps, and being able to get those resources on the go. And that can be very meaningful to the, the people out on the, on the trail in that Indiana Dunes uh, example. Uh, a lot of the, the folks out on their discovery trail will talk about the bird that they sighted or the, 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 the other wildlife or the unique element and all in, in real time and the ability to, um, to, to build that experience um, can be uh, really powerful. Brooke's comment prompted me to think of something I forgot to mention, which is the idea of what kind of additional activities could we create on national forest land? Because uh, the Western Slope communities went to Congress, they got the law changed to allow them to expand into their summertime activities. And um, one of the things I learned a while back was that Allen's Park used to have three different ski runs. Oh, and I haven't figured out where they were or what the, <laughs> and Jim Pickering is shaking his head yes. Um, I don't know if you can fill us in on that at all, or... Well, if you go to Allen's Park, you'll see ski... If you turn into Allen's Park, you'll see the first road is called Ski Road, and that takes you right up to the, to the mountain. They were very, very popular in their day. That, that whole issue um, is uh, sort of a, a challenge for a lot of communities, and a lot of it depends on the individual national park superintendent or, or forest supervisor, and just how engaging, how willing they are to, to, to think about is it is it um, land uh, preservation and and, and uh, stewardship, is it community engagement, is it recreation, and and there can be different perspectives in terms of how much is is good and how much is is not good, but certainly if you can. In terms of the, the current relationship with the uh, Forest Service, how do you, how would you characterize? I, I don't really have a feel for it. I know there's probably other people in the room who do. Yeah, one thing though, I would think that as this type of, of uh, organization or, or entity uh, becomes more structured, um, that representation would be someone that you would absolutely want in the, in the dialogue, in the, in the discussion. Yeah, I think, I think what our utilization of Forest Service land is minimal, and I think that's a, an area we could definitely dive into and, and get a lot more involved in working with, working with our local forest uh, office, for sure. I wanted, to, I wanted to go back to a comment Scott made, and he reminded us of our branding and, and our term base camp. And, and when I sit here and listen to all of this, um, really trying to help us be and identify with a base camp. And if we're gonna base camp here and travel to our Eldora, if we're gonna base camp here, travel up into the forest, up to Allen's Park, whatever, and really uh, own that and live that uh, idea. It's very appealing, I think, to uh, a lot of our guests, the fact that they're at base camp, and uh, it's very unique, I think. That's, a, that's an interesting one, and, and I've talked to some of you already, but part of that is, is who, who plants their flag? with that identity and while there could be a, a wide range of destinations that could say we should be that that base camp it's who sort of plants that flag starts using that identity using that that uh, that name john was there someone that oh sorry back yeah. yeah i just um with the ss park running club we put on a trail race in the fall and uh part of well the land that we run on is in the national forest over on Pole Hill, and one of our experiences and feedback was, um, you know, when we designed races, it can't be close to a wilderness area either, and so um, it space is really limited. And um, what our experience was that they were they were pretty protective. Yeah. So maybe through time, there's a building relationship. I know that um, you know we've been really working towards a stronger relationship. And their office is based in Fort Collins um, that manages this area. But um, I would say that they're pretty protective, but they're very open to the, um, the four-wheeling vehicles 
up oh, on Paul right? Road. Oh. Oh. So, um, yes, yeah. yeah, so they were, yeah. they're, they're good with that, but I think with the running part, so it's a whole new group. Well, well I, I think that as, as these discussions continue, you know, someone had mentioned the, the weddings um, uh, concept and, you know, are there more opportunities on forest lands with weddings? Is, is there more running opportunities? Are there, um, but a lot of that, is, is sort of twofold. One is demonstrating how you can have a, a light footprint with some of these um, concepts and ideas. And also sometimes, you know, are there, are there ways where maybe some of the revenue streams or um, uh, some of the elements or infrastructure development that the Forest Service doesn't have the resources where that can be brought and we can solve some of their issues or, or problems and we don't go into it just thinking of a, a one-way street, is there a win-win uh, here? But that certainly takes that dialogue and, and discussion to uh, foster that kind of uh, thinking and, and relationship down, down the road. So, so Kyle wanted to make sure people understood that the National Park Service, Rocky Mountain National Park, and the Forest Service are two entirely oh, different they are. entities, <laughs> and they have two entirely different set of rules. They certainly are. Um, and I think most of us in this room are aware of that, but you know, when you start talking about wilderness versus Forest Service, there is some confusion sometimes about where the boundaries are and who can do what and where. And what a national park can and cannot do with some of their restrictions is in Forest Service. Certainly a, a different set of, of rules, but you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, very different animals. Well, and a lot of the wilderness um, uh, requirements are actually, I mean, I hate to sound bureaucratic, so you all know me and you know that I don't want to sound bureaucratic, but a lot of the wilderness regulations are national policy. Yep. And, and so that could also be, um, you know, part of the challenge as well. Yep. yep. Okay, that's my bureaucratic speak. <laughs> Were there other, I, other I think we that? had a, a kind of a digression on the communications and talked a lot about how the community a lot of times doesn't know what events are going on. And we talked about what resources are out there and yet uh, people at the local level don't necessarily know what's going on. So how do we reach people, get a broader reach? There's all these different communications channels. We have an events calendar at Visit Estes Park, but um, how can we actually get our community more engaged? And I think that would remove some obstacles in terms of, you know, every resident here is a potential uh, referral source for, for guests. Absolutely, sure. Well, and, and, and that can be um, a, a real challenge where you've got some of these things that you know could resonate with a the, with the resident base, but how do you get them engaged and how do you get that, that message out? That can be a, a challenge. And sometimes we, we talk about, and I'll put Elizabeth on the spot a little bit, but so much of, of the focus is our marketing is to our external visitors and not really thinking that much about should we have an internal marketing campaign and how would that look? And I'm, I'm not sure what you're, what you're doing. Um, I, I give to Michael. And actually, my comment was there's a, that is, I think, a major obstacle that we in this room have got to go figure out how to deal with. There, for instance, there's a really ugly meeting going on at Town Hall right now about the Wellness Center development plan. And um, enough so that there's two police officers in the room. Oh, well. And it's... Uh, well, well th thank you for having a more calm group here for, uh, for me today. It, it, yeah. it, it, <laughs> it, it is just amazing to me the level of I moved here 30 years ago, and I want this to stay exactly like it was 30 years ago. And yet, the group here, we're, we're talking about looking into the future. We've got this big rock that somehow or another we've got to overcome as a community. Well, and that's, a, that's an ongoing challenge, and the, the whole resident rebellion and how that can, can come back. And, and I think in, in a couple of, of instances, I was referring to that internal campaign primarily of activities and, and you know, festivals and, and engagement, but more and more destinations are, are recognizing they've got to do a better job talking about the role of the visitor industry and think about our own resident base as one of our marketing targets. And we've got to have, well, certainly not the same kind of scale, but we've got, you know, we're marketing experts. We've got to be thinking of them as one of our um, uh, logical uh, basis that we've got to do a better job explaining how tourism benefits all the, the good things 
And, and just to, to, to reinforce that, what we can't do and what too many uh, communities um, attempt with this is they have the annual meeting in front of a council or a county board of supervisors and it's the, uh, the once a, a year with a little document. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like any good marketing, it's the drip, drip, drip. How do we have some small consumable bite-sized types of pieces that we get out on three, four, seven times uh, a year, but make sure that we're reaching them in, in more uh, ongoing and, and, uh, uh, and powerful kinds of ways. I think there's been a couple shifts just in the recent past. One of them was with the wellness campaign. They certainly had their struggle coming out of the gate and it wasn't until that campaign shifted their speak to here's what the residents get out of the wellness center and that partnership with the Estes Park Medical Center. At that point that campaign did a complete 180 and it passed by, I don't remember the percentage, but it changed everything. Um, certainly at Visit Estes Park we don't speak of the guest unless we're speaking also with the resident. To me, to me, they're one and the same. I know to our board and our staff, they're one and the same. Um, we probably in the past didn't do such a good job with the community calendar, but it's been a huge part of our focus for the last nine months and just letting people know what that calendar represents and what it can offer the community. And many of those events slide over to the guest calendar as well. Um, but there's certainly more work to be done on that front, but it's not marketing speak. I, I can't think of the guest without thinking of the resident equally, resident equally, and one does not come before the other. So I think you'll see more of that moving into the future in a very strong way. Well, and as you can have some of these ideas, ensuring that that resident base is aware of it as well as the external visitors, uh, really important. Final general barrier, and then we'll turn it over to group number two, right. which was uh, the concern was voiced is, will our town leadership really embrace what the Generation X, Millennials, younger folks find appealing. And I guess that kind of comes back to where we started the morning. Are we building the product and then trying to attract the customer? Or are we going to define the customer and then follow where that leads us in terms of what we offer? Yeah, and, and uh, I think you, you do need to start with that customer and say, what, what are the segments? that you believe hold the greatest potential for the destination, work off of some of the work you guys have, have already done in that customer segmentation that you're using in your marketing decisions and those kinds of, of elements, but, um, but really think through uh, that way. And, and hopefully there's, there's some of those solutions where it might, like in this particular instance, speak to some of the, the younger audiences, but at the same time, um, you know, help some of the residents and, and the, the, the kids and the families are intrigued by um, some and it becomes a, a, a more uh, powerful uh, place to call home because there's more things for the younger kids um, uh, to do as well. So I'll turn it over to number two if we can All find right. them. Any other thoughts for, for John or the, the points that he's raised before he passes the baton? All right, number two. Show of hands. Uh, all right. So as I mentioned before, we kind of talked a lot in similar areas about um, events as well as sort of like leveraging existing um, opportunity with recreation and that type of thing. Um, one of the big topics of conversation was kind of improving our downtown guest experience um, for our group. That included all kinds of things, everything from developing Cleve Street um, and kind of cleaning that area up to um, developing a food scene, which isn't necessarily specific to downtown, but throughout the community that, and I'll start here in this area by saying we ha did recognize that over the last 10 to 15 years in retail and restaurants, we have come a long way. We do have some businesses in both areas that either offer something new or have that consistent guest experience that aren't catering to the one time, one and done sort of visitor, but really respect that return visitor and trying to create a great experience. So we've made a, made a lot of strides, so I want to say that first. Um, but I think most people in this room would agree that we don't have a whole lot to offer the foodie. Um, and a lot of our thoughts and, and, and ideas around um, destination development had to do with things that used to be maybe a driver or a differentiator, but anymore are almost an expectation or an amenity that people 
might not make their decision on to come here, um, but they might make their decision not to come here if we don't have that. And I think a food scene, while we have good, some good restaurants, a food scene is one thing that if you're a foodie you're gonna, and you're trying to decide, I wanna go to Rocky, do I stay in Boulder or do I stay in Estes? It's not a difficult decision in that realm if that's an important factor to you. Um, and I think shopping is, is along the same lines. And we talked about how Brooke, do we- Brooke, before yeah. you, you go on, on that, that food, I think the, the follow-on point is that's a really critical element. If, if we're talking about trying to expand an arts and cultural um, experience, attracting some of those higher uh, educated, higher spending, longer stays, that food, um, you're right. It's, it's not a, um, it would be nice. It's, it's an essential element that, that that's got to be part of the experience and it, and it really leverages uh, these other uh, elements, thinking back to that geotourism slide that that person who's engaged in a great art experience is expecting to be able to have a, uh, an attractive, uh, engaging kind of dinner. Yeah, and I know there's a lot of wheels turning in the community with the wellness development as far as how can we engage that in our food scene. And, you know, I think that will help bring out some of these things. You know, do we, I know we are starting to have more of like the, um, the non-gluten options where we do have some vegetarian options. We even have at least one restaurant that I know of that has a very organized vegetarian menu that you can access digitally separate from everything else. Um, you know, so I think we're, we're taking steps there, but we are, still need to move um, towards the food scene. And we talked about how do we attract that, and I think that's a little bit more of a challenge. And this kind of came up um, whenever we were talking about private capital development or investment. Um, it came up as far as our reputation as a community not necessarily being development friendly and not necessarily being entrepreneur friendly. And I think, you know, again, I know the town has their eye on that and they're trying to take some steps in that direction. Um, but, you know, once you get a reputation for something, it's pretty hard to overcome that. So we're going to have to be aggressive in that area, according to our group, um, in order to attract that development investment, whether that's in restaurants or lodging or um, amenities and attractions. And those are exactly the, the kinds of businesses that are small, don't have a lot of expertise in development. It's not the chain guy who's developed 50 others uh, around the country. And so right. having that, that uh, business friendly kind of orientation that allows some of their creativity to be focused on the food and not so much on how in the world do we uh, yeah. get the permit is a, a, a big point. Yeah, and I think, you know, we also talked about um, just kind of costs in general also being a barrier to entry. So if you are a young chef and you have great ideas, finding investors or, or having the capital yourself is really challenging in a market as expensive as SS Park. We didn't go quite that far in the group, but um, talked about the, those barriers to entry. Um, we also talked about downtown holding land, setting standards and holding landlords accountable to those standards. So in really requiring people to improve their properties, if, if not at least maintain their properties, um, having a higher expectation for how you present a property, especially in that downtown district, but I think that's applicable throughout the destination. Um, develop, uh, development opportunities at Elkhorn Lodge, you know, this has been a center of, of um, desire and a shiny object for us for quite some time. Um, how do we develop that and take advantage of that? Um, we talked about, again, what I see is um, <coughs> amen not amenities, but attractions that were once maybe a differentiator for some communities, but anymore, at least in Colorado, have become an expectation, and that is like zip line, alpine slide, adventure park type of activities. People are looking for that. You can get that a lot of places in the state, and you can't get it here um, on a large scale. We have a couple, couple of those things, but that then, opportunity uh, being recognized as um, something that could be done at Elkhorn Lodge. And Brooke, just, just to, to reinforce that point, those elements could be great uh, additions, but just remember back when we were talking about what, how, how do we differentiate ourselves and you know, a different um, environment, but uh, uh, Great Wolf Lodge um, uh, is more back in the Midwest, but the, the first few destinations that got that in, a great indoor uh, lodge and, and water park, and boy, the, the ones that secured that, they had a, a, a real competitive advantage until the second one and the third one and the seventh one and the eighth one. It's not and a exactly as, advantage if you right, can replicate As you it. say, you know, you, you, those can yeah. be great, but if it's just a me too. Yeah. Um, no, I agree. Yep. 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 Um, Good point. And on that note, we, since you brought it up, we did talk about indoor water park. Um, it's something that isn't 
isn't prevalent in Colorado at all right now. It is something replicable, obviously, but I think would add that extra amenity year round for rainy days in the summer, but also, of course, um, in the winter would be a great attractor for especially that front range market. Want a quick and easy and not huge investment for a family getaway for the weekend um, would be an amenity. And, and I think you're Absolutely. right, would, sure. would yeah. be replicable, but um, would offer a greater um, variety of experiences and things to back up those rainy days and such. We talked a lot about parking, um, which we have some great solutions, including signage and shuttles and employee parking shuttles and all kinds of things. But I don't know that it, um, I don't know that it's beneficial to get too deep into that. Um, you know, winter events. We talked about events. We talked about tr trying to find some. You know, finding that Scott Fest for the winter or finding that Bluegrass Festival. It, could we have a winter music series or a winter music festival in the new events complex that would really be a draw? Mm. We talked about really needing the big names in order to get that attendance and draw those people. And I think that's been a challenge sometimes with concerts or music festivals or festivals in general for Estes Park that if you don't have that initial investment to really attract that crowd, then it's hard to hard to get that going, or it's easy to say, well, we tried it and it didn't work. Well, why? <laughs> um, I think that initial investment is, is often um, part of that issue. Um, did I miss anything, group? I think that other than what we had already talked about, that kind of covers what we... Any other thoughts on, on the points that Brooke has, has raised? Yeah, John? Now I'm eating an apple, so I'll <laughs> work around that. Um, we talked about the differentiation and that, you know, we've been talking a lot about creative arts districts, and there's probably, you know, uh, 15 towns in line ahead of us, so recently the concept came up of maker's districts, and it would kind of play to the idea of culinary arts, mm -hmm. crafts, et cetera, but it would be a little, it would be seen less as artsy as more individual arts, crafts, culinary arts, and it might have a little different feel and brand. I didn't know if you had any thoughts on that or, because uh, that, it's certainly, a, if you're the, the 15th creative arts district to get cert, state certification, that doesn't really sound like right, a great right. differentiator to me. That's a really intriguing area. And when Brooke is saying, how do we intrigue some of the young chefs to come and think Estes Park? If you had that type of a, of a baker's district and you started getting identified um, uh, along that line, that, that is, um, is an intriguing um, mix and, and orientation that I think could hold some interesting potential. The, um, I, I was talking about the Santa Fe example where it was the, their, their culinary academy. And maybe it's, it's also not just that, that, that it's the bakers, it's how do you come and improve your, your baking skills and, and um, become you know, the, you know, certified Estes Park baker or whatever, that a lot of fun things that could potentially be done uh, along that lines. Um, what about uh, group three? All right, coming in from the, the back end here, huh? All right, um, our group, we had a, you can tell we had um, a lot of hikers in our group as well that were kind of tapped into the emotion of the area. Um, we looked less at the brick and mortar and more at the existing things that the um, area has to offer and how it kind of develops a product that is, can be maybe packaged and, and marketed. Um, obviously some of the things that we looked at that are pretty obvious that will never change, Rocky Mountain National Park, the wildlife of the area, and then we also touched on wellness because that obviously is an area that we're kind of branching out in. And we also looked at the, the benefits of the FLAP grant and <clears throat> try to come up with ways where we can kind of join all of that so that it, it kind of brings the, we kind of think there's an emotion that's available that can be sold and, and almost as its own little product of joining the mind, the body, and the spirit. And I think one of the reasons that people do come here is to join those things. And there's a natural kind of raw emotion when you drive up the canyon Nick brought it up where you just kind of get that, wow. And you don't get that when you go over the I-70 corridor. You get, geez, just let me get to my exit. And, you know, let me, let me get to where I need to be. So, um, and then Jimmy, you have to maybe help me with this. But 
jump right at the idea of environmental outdoor education, which was kind of getting back and not losing our roots of the kind of the concepts of the Y camp and Bill brought that up and Chile camp. They have some deep founding roots there that are not necessarily based in technology. They're based more in just good old basic old fashioned principles. And so as much as we need technology and we all, you know, sadly kind of depend on it, there is something simple about coming up here, driving into the park and looking at your phone and going, I got no connection. And so I think there's a product that's available with that, but it's an emotional product. And so that kind of went on to, and this is where Jim was talking about, developing a program of education that brings families together and kind of, you were kind of going off that kind of found it, you know, finding ways to bring families up here to live here, work from home, etc. cetera. I'll, uh, I'll hand you the mic. It was kind of a complex mostly, thing. What I was talking about was a magnet school within the Estes Park school system, a residential program uh, focusing on outdoor education and the environment uh, where uh, children would actually come and perhaps live with families in the community under some kind of contractual arrangement and then take classes within, within the Estes Park School. Uh, you could probably start as early as eighth grade and maybe go through high school. We know what a tremendous success uh, the Eagle Rock School has been as a residential program for uh, students who need certain kinds of things. Uh, we have uh, hundreds, thousands of, of young people who come through the YMCA each summer, thousands who come through Chile Camp, and for whom a Chile experience is one of the foundation marks of their lives looking back. And it seems to me this is something that we could talk about with the Estes Park School System uh, as a way of helping them uh, with their enrollment problems uh, and also creating uh, some additional experiences for our kids here in Estes Park. We also found that one of the unique things, and I think we all know this too, is there's a, this is one of the most accessible mountain arrangements there is. If you go over into the ski areas and, and places like that, sometimes it involves hiking, sometimes it involves waiting in lines, things of that nature. And we just felt like there's an era of accessibility and renewability. And there's something nice about being able to drive into the park and you're right there. I mean, you're, you drive into the park, you're like, it's right there. And you don't always get that experience when you're skiing. Granted, you're on the side of a mountain, but maybe it, it just wasn't that simple of an experience. You had to go through lines and gates. Here, you can drive up here, drive into the park, and have a, a wow experience. And so we found that there was, a, there was an ability to come here and renew yourself. And I think that there's, there's, you know, there's, that's like a product in and of itself where you can come in and just take a moment and kind of get yourself collected and get back to what your core is. Um, we also talked about signage around like Lake Estes and maybe finding a way to join more of a park system or a, a trail system so it's easier for people to get on a trail, walk around. Um, Susie brought up maybe putting up signs of inspiration. Um, I think there's, there's definitely validity in signs about, you know, so you can learn about the area. Um, I think that, you know, the sign every spring that says dangerous um, <laughs> when you're, you know, in the, by the bird area, I like the sign that always says, you know, danger, aggressive mom elk, and you're like, who gets to see that every day? <laughs> you know, so I think there's something about being able to educate people about how unique it is and how accessible it is. Um, let's see, we talked about, and this kind of goes along the lines of the Flap Grand and the, the pedestrian mall, and build a downtown area that allows tourists and locals to live in a cohesive environment. And right now we felt like one of the things that we're kind of lacking, especially for the locals, is a cohesive environment where we can go just take in a night of entertainment or music or food is a, is a huge one as well. So we just wanted an area where everybody can kind of blend together and you live in, and you, you kind of take it to that next step where you can kind of go just enjoy where you live instead of working where you live. Um, economy of preservation. Basically, let's not screw this up. And kind of the principle behind that is let's not build a bunch of things that are gonna block views or the biggest concern there was let's not follow a trend that is eventually gonna expire itself and need to be knocked down. Uh, I think the most, 
probably the thing that I like the most about our, we came up with is we are, we are a community that is homegrown, not corporate owned. And so when you go to the ski areas, they definitely have the, the money. We are a group of individuals that are trying to make this thing work. And that's why it's so hard. Um, factors, <laughs> boy, uh, we kind of, we felt like there was maybe a struggle between knowing who we are and what we want to be. And I think we all know in this room the direction that we would like to go, but we're all not necessarily on the same page. So we thought it would be nice if we all kind of knew what we were doing. We felt like there, maybe there was somewhat of a schism between locals, tourists, and retirees, and not knowing what, what group do I belong to? And is it bad to belong to one group? Is it better to belong to another group? Or do I need to hide what group I belong to? Um, land use codes, building codes are definitely going to always be an obstacle. Uh, the good old fashioned resistance to change. Um, not affordable to live here. And it does make it difficult for people to you know, move up the hill. Brooke kind of touched on that as well, that you can't just come up here as a, as a chef and go, hey, I'm going to open a restaurant. You really need a pretty deep pocket to pull that off. So we just, those were just kind of some of the obstacles we came up with. Thoughts, comments? You know, I, I, I like thinking about linking and, and talking about those existing assets <laughs> and, and how can some of those be brought uh, uh, more into play. And a number of the points you brought up really sort of um, reinforces you know what Bill was talking about sort of family and what we saw on the the visitor it it it, it just is um, reinforcing that sort of underlying um, theme of, of family and safety and um, and fun who wants to be four and look at this. She, she's bringing her iPad and is uh, uh, 15 pages of, uh, of notes. <laughs> um, the first example our group came up with, it's more of an amenity and service that all the businesses would benefit from. Um, Drop-off daycare downtown with possibly the Y staffing it. They do such a fantastic job <laughs> at the location, at the Y already. <laughs> Were you ready for this? <laughs> You should have been at our table. Um, so yeah, they just do a fantastic job and a lot of the local families drop their children off at the Y Great. currently. But if we could add on an additional location downtown, that would just provide an incredible service and meet a need that uh, we all struggle with here in town. Support for that means a need for residents and guests. Restrictions are primarily insurance, staffing, regulations, it ultimately would need a subsidy to really pull it off just because the costs would likely outweigh the revenue stream. <laughs> uh, we talked about the art, arts culture a lot. Um, craft Center downtown would be nice again, uh, nice as well with the Y. They do an incredible craft center um, that is apparently one of their most favorite activities by guests and kids at the Y. So if we could have that more downtown Cetric as well, and similar to the incubator space at the right, the Jensen Jensen yep. example, correct. Um, we discussed a little bit more about um, arts and how that can incorporate anything that's made in Estes. So when we mentioned arts initially, it's obvious that we're talking about painters and photographers and sculptures and even jewelry makers, but. We thought as a group that it includes anything made in Estes. So that includes distilleries and um, breweries and even food made in Estes, chocolate and so forth. So we could really embrace this arts and crafts culture and even have um, an event at Bun Park that is arts and crafts fair. We probably call it something a little different, but essentially an arts and crafts fair of made in Estes. And this would benefit all the stores in town, and it probably would create some new businesses in town that want to be a part of that um, collective interest. Also with the arts, we talked about our farmer's market and how there's opportunity to possibly have an Estes Park space at the farmer's market where we celebrate everything there is to do in Estes. And there again, we could have an artist painting and a craft brewer there as well. And then the following week, maybe we'll have a photographer with a winery. So we'll celebrate Made in Estes at the Farmer's Market, which is a great way for our residents to get to know our community, celebrate what's here, but also our guests 
we all know attend the farmers market as well. They want to be, they're here as a guest, but they want to feel like a local. Um, so a great opportunity to celebrate Estes and share um, what we all represent here in town. I, I really like that idea and, and bringing some of that sort of front and center, make it really easy for those residents to understand some of the things that are in their own backyard that they might not, you know, some of the comments that we've heard today that, um, you know, just we're not connecting enough and that, that seems like a, a very logical uh, connection there that, that could have some strong power. John had a so point. Just to add to that, uh, Ted Williams at Colorado Hats, not here today, has long had the concept of having uh, Ted Williams at Colorado Hats has long had the concept of creating kind of a craft cluster where his he makes custom western hats he knows custom saddle makers jewelry makers etc that are all western themed and how can we attract a cluster of those kind of businesses and create a western themed area that would really be a part of that sort of building off both the Western heritage and the arts and culture and, and something that, that Estes Parks really owns and be hard for others to duplicate. Great. So support for the arts conversation consists of many artists in town and also locals and guests are interested. Restrictions, coordinating the arts community and needs to be on a regular schedule. Um, the arts district committee has been working really hard as of late on an art walk as well that we're really excited about and hopefully that'll be launched by summer so we're already moving in the right direction there and you know we realized it was important to surround these artists which are so great with creativity but we need to put people at the table that are good with logistics and getting things done and helping them with that support so we recognize that and i, th I think we're going to pull it off we got very excited about outdoor adventure activities and amenities everything from zip lines to alpine slides mountain luge, zorbs, snow tubing, water tubing, mini water kayak park when the town digs up the river for the post-flood um, river mitigation, putting in mini water kayak parks, ice skating, we need to talk about if we should move the location and find a more successful spot for that. Water features for kids to play in, we see this all over the nation really, but Colorado's embraced this. When you go to other mountain towns, there's water features that come up from the ground that kids play in and the uh, parents get to sit by with a beer or Kool-Aid and just let their kids play and relax. Support for this, it's what guests and residents want. We see this reinforced in other mountain towns. Restriction, land, cost, investors, developers, and so forth. Um, we do think Estes is reaching a point where we can start reaching out to businesses and manufacturers and investors who do this for a living and really start tooting our horn, courting these people and bringing them to our town. A lot of investors and manufacturers who build this type of infrastructure don't even know we exist. It's hard for us to believe that, but it's true. So I think we're reaching a point with the EDC and the town and Visit Estes Park and the other associations that are all a part of this community where we can work together collaboratively and go and court these businesses that we've decided as a community are a good fit. But that's why we're all meeting here today. You know, if, if I can just reinforce that point because that is really, really critical where you're the ones who can put the, the right story together, the right spin, here's all the, the different opportunities, and we, you, you can sort of sit back and, and hope that development entity at some point finds Estes, does the homework, does the feasibility, but the more you can do some of that heavy lifting up front and then go out, as you say, and, and move more in a recruitment mode, really, uh, I think I'm losing my battery here. Um, <clears throat> very good, though. Okay. Uh, quick one. Charlotte, North Carolina hides mice around their town. Um, this is similar to the Denver Museum that hides little, what are they, Frank? What do they hide at the museum? Gnomes. Um, we could hide possibly pikas or elk or what have you around town, which is a great activity for families to enjoy with their children. So they're wandering around the river walk in downtown looking for these little pikas. Ducks. Ducks. Uh, hut to hut trips. Um, Kyle, do you want to take a little break? No, I do not. 
<laughs> so hut to hut trips. We know how popular these are in Colorado, so we were brainstorming. Um, cross country ski up Trail Ridge and camp out at the Trail Ridge store up top. Or find a way to work with the existing cabins in the park to cross country from one cabin to another. Just, just a thought, no pressure. <laughs> Um, history. History is important to our community and we're very unique in Estes compared to other Colorado towns are known for their mining. We've always been known for tourism, right? So we should celebrate that and find new ways with our existing assets to capitalize on that. The Stanley House is an incredible opportunity. This keeps me up at night. Um, that house is for sale and the current owner has kept it intact. There's original wallpaper and original floors and original piano. It's a museum in and of itself right now. Um, and it's important to them that they sell it to someone or an entity or a nonprofit that will keep that history intact. And when I think about the um, future of our museum that the town thankfully is investing in, and to tie that into the Stanley House, it's just an incredible opportunity for us to celebrate our history. Yeah, our history. yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. They took my level or back in the back and uh, <laughs> must not recognize that. Uh... <laughs> uh, get some good dirt in the back rooms here, huh? So, um, yeah. In exactly the same having to go off on type of things you're talking about, battery, part of the history of this valley and, and, and the town and everything, H. Bar G. Ranch is, is just literally um, disintegrating in, in front of us. And yet it's a beautiful piece of property up there that could be used and, and found some of it real advantage to whether it was this, this winter type activity that you're talking about or whether it was summer hiking back up into the whole forest service area that we were talking about earlier. There are other, there may be other pieces of property around that can be similarly uh, reused. Trying to, your enhanced idea, yep. basically. Yep, absolutely. And then a final idea for history is continue the historic, historic uh, walks we have with our local docents, but also have an app available. I've done this in other communities where I just wanted to go with my friends and be able to talk and take my time and stop in for a beer or an appetizer through the walk. So have a formal app that people can take throughout the community and have a historical walk and learn about our history. Festivals included everything from mountain man camp competition to street busters. Apparently there's no busker festivals in the state of Colorado. Ropes course, pickleball, bluegrass festival, um, Lake Estes, possibly putting bouncy gyms on the water. That's something new and upcoming. We all know about the bouncy gyms you put at fairs and carnivals, but now they have them for the water. Boat races with either kayak or kinetics like Boulder used to do. Uh, no, this one came up last night from someone. Uh, they suggested a houseboat that would be connected to either the marina or Estes Park Resort that would be like an outdoor bar that could cruise around the lake and then come back and <coughs> drop off passengers. <laughs> And I think that covered it. Did I miss anything from my group? One of the things we brought up too is people remember the Lazy Bee. Um, been around here. I mean, I mean, a lot of people miss that. That was a, a great amenity, and now the the other that was a, a chuck wagon dinner ranch. You go and hear corny cowboy music and eat, but it was very, very popular. My kids loved to come up here going down. And the um, the Flying W was the other one in the Colorado that did that, and it burned down uh, in the Waldo Park fire. So um, it's another thing that it, it was very popular. A lot of people came up for that. 
Very good. Thanks, Elizabeth. So, number five, who's, um, who's going to help us with five? All right. The official scribe. There you go. Thank you. My kids still talk about the lazy bee, Frank. Uh, you're right. That was a, that was a lot of fun. Um, our group kind of talked about new ideas and old ideas. Uh, some have already been mentioned, so I, I won't uh, dig too deep into those. And um, some upcoming projects that uh, we felt like we needed to support. And uh, last but not least, we talked about enhancing some existing products. We felt like that, that was important. All right. Uh, the first thing we talked about is something that Brooke talked about, and that is uh, skiing in Eldora and uh, working out some kind of a strategic alliance with them. And our thinking was, why would we do this? Well, why would people want to stay in Netherlands or go to Boulder when they could come up here for a much better experience? Uh, they could have that romantic mountain uh, getaway that we talked about, uh, good meals. Uh, we could have a, a shuttle bus bring them up here so they wouldn't have to drive, so they wouldn't have to worry about road conditions, there'd be no stress, things like that. We also realized that uh, uh, some of the restrictions might be the, uh, the cost of the shuttle bus, um, road conditions even for the buses, the distance, time it may take to get here, and the fact that Eldora may not be willing to uh, discount lift tickets with us. But we felt like that was probably something that was worth, uh, worth looking into. Um, another thing we talked about was an adventure park that uh, would have a winter play area as well as a summer year-round area. And we've already talked about these. <laughs> I think some of these things are going to sound very familiar. But as far as a winter play area, we talked about the possibility of uh, teaching people uh, curling and broom ball and uh, have an open skating area, maybe even having a fire pit where people could sit around and have micro brews and things like that. So it would have a, a wide broad of, a, of attraction to it. Um, why do it? No one else has it right now. Uh, support, uh, we felt like there were a lot of reasons to support it. Uh, curling's pretty popular. People are always looking for new things to do in the winter. Um, Restrictions might be uh, if it would be consistently cold enough up here, believe right. it or not, right. to do things like that uh, in the winter. And it would be a relatively short season. As far as the summer events, we've talked about water slides and alpine slides and zip lines, uh, something that, that could uh, be close to downtown, uh, would keep shoppers in the area. Um, let's see here. Can, can be, I? Uh, go ahead. My, this still is not uh, cooperating, but um, when, when we talked about s some of these outdoor zip lines and, and the, the water parks and those kinds of things, the one thing while I was uh, on one side, I was saying differentiation and, and think differently. The one thing you've got to, uh, to recognize is you've got a huge uh, competitive advantage with the park. And my, my experience has been more in youth sports facilities where multiple destinations will build the soccer fields or the, uh, the, the play uh, ball fields, but it's the destinations like in Indiana Dunes where you've got the beach or down in, in, in Florida where you've got that, that competitive advantage. So even though some of these uh, additional elements that you were uh, noting there uh, might be present in other destinations. It really is, it's, it's that accelerant that works off the driver and, and sort of recognizing that while others might have a similar product, they don't have the park outside their front door. Really important. <clears throat> Keeping with the uh, adventure park theme for just another minute or two, um, we talked about uh, some of the restrictions we might run into, and parking would be one of them. However, it was pointed out uh, uh, at our table that there is some land available in the area, one of the areas we were looking at, uh, which was the uh, possibility of the Elkhorn Lodge property, uh, and use that for redevelopment. Uh, I don't know if that's possible or not, but that was just an idea we still had. I mentioned a minute ago that we were talking about supporting things that are in the works. We felt like we needed to uh, step in and really uh, help support EPIC, the Performing Arts Center that's being proposed downtown. And uh, Adam talked a lot about that already and uh, talked about it in our group. Uh, supporting reasons for, well, it's obviously year-round, shopping downtown. Everybody would benefit from having something downtown. Um, funding being one of the restrictions. Uh, they're out there right now trying to get um, 
pledges and real money both. Um, that may hold it up until they get enough, enough money uh, uh, dedicated. Uh, they've uh, already admitted they've changed the model. It uh, now will be a boutique hotel and uh, nice performing arts center, which will have more of an appeal for the, the high-end visitor. Um, when, what, did you have a, a, a question on one of these points? Let me just, yeah. And I don't know, I mean, all smaller resorts that can't afford buying, say, like they said they would discount lift tickets if you did 50 or more. Smaller resorts that can't, say, do 50 or more, they're completely open to um, if you combined buying them with another resort. Yep, yep. You don't have to buy them all yourself. You can combine it with another resort and then still get that discount. So Eldora is completely, their outside sales department is completely open to doing that. Interesting. Good. Just tying into that, I, I think it was a couple of winters ago, the Stanley actually worked with Rocky Mountain Rush to provide lifts and, and packages to go to Eldora from here, which was a good combination. Rocky Mountain Rush runs the Red Jeep Tours, and he's, work, he's working really hard to make his business year-round, and that allowed him to do some things, too, with his four-wheel drive and run people down to uh, Eldora. So there's some synergies there that, that have been tried and could be expanded upon. Just a couple more things before I go off of the, the Performing Arts Center. As far as restrictions, um, parking, ADA accessibility, uh, room for tour buses, current codes. We know the building is in a, in a flood plain. There's a lot of unknowns about that right now. And there is a uh, business, small number of businesses that are against it, so you have an image problem. Mm -hmm. All right, here's an oldie but a goodie. Downtown Pedestrian Mall on Elkhorn. Uh, we'd like to see it between Dairy Queen to the Water Wheel on the West End. Uh, it would create a better guest experience, uh, a really new landscape downtown that would be very appealing. Uh, it would attract families, uh, have a, uh, for visitors, it would be more a pleasant experience to be able to walk casually downtown, maybe even eat outside. A lot of uh, nice kiosk vendors and stuff like that. Uh, restrictions, obviously if you do it in the winter, you can have icy sidewalks. We talked about the possibility of heating them, so we'd be the only community with an outdoor ice-free sidewalks hmm. in the winter. Uh, of course, uh, you're talking about state highways, so you got some problems there. And then you'd be rerouting most of your main traffic uh, along the river. Do we really want to do that? And if we do, then what's the vision for the river corridor? Uh, we want to go in there and put a lot of shops in along the river court. Any thoughts? A new idea. Uh, this was Adams. I'll give him full credit for this. He wanted to see a laser show at Lake Estes. It would be something that would be Rocky Mountain National Park themed as well as Estes Park. Uh, there would be music that would be key to it. It would be something that tourists could see either before or after they came back from the park. It would be unique. Nobody else around here does it. Uh, I suppose most of you have been to Disneyland and you've probably seen the, uh, the nightly laser show they do there. We could do a very similar thing here with, uh, on Lake Estes, which I think would be very attractive. We just add there, um, um, Sedona uh, is attempting something similar and they had some tests uh, earlier uh, last year where it was showing the lasers up on the red rocks. and. Um, not it was only for certain special events but it was how do we bring an additional set of of experiences and and you know absolutely no environmental related issues uh but uh a new and different kinds of ways to to bring a new uh level in using the lasers um so i i think that's uh, uh, an intriguing idea of course uh That would be. 
I was just getting to the restrictions. I was, I'll throw that one out first. There's people that live on the lake. I think, Adam, weren't, weren't you saying you, you would supply the sunglasses for uh, each of the residents? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> You're going to have a... Dogs that freak out during Scottish Fest. You got a lot of a lot of moving parts with this because you're obviously got to talk to the people that live on the lake. You got to talk with Rocky Mountain National Park people. You got to talk to uh, the BLM for their support. It is their lake and their dam. Is that right? Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. And it's going to be a need for some sort of public and private uh, cooperation and funding. So it's it's a long way from happening. There's a lot of things that would need to be done, but it's still a great idea. I don't think that should uh, damn mm -hmm. us from at least looking at it. I, I suppose you could look at other locations too, but I know I'm going to drive Colin nuts if I mention Lumpy Ridge because that would be <laughs> the closest to Sedona, but that's in the National Park. And also, lasers are not a problem for dogs, but they are for cats. <laughs> 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 uh, talking about an existing amenity that we already have that's probably being underutilized is Performance Park. And we felt like that needed to be utilized more, especially for entertainment and stuff. Uh, currently, I believe there is a uh, bike-in movie night on Thursday nights. Is that right? Okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's, that's what was mentioned. But we feel like it's, it's a great venue to attract families, uh, tourists, as well as locals. Uh, it just needs to be used more. It's just underutilized. Hmm. And I guess that's it for group five. Well, good. Six. Lots of um, lots of ideas. And I think the thing that strikes me is, as we sort of hear the, the different perspectives, a lot of, of different ideas. But I think it, it really speaks to the creati creativity that can come together when you get some of the, the right heads, the right minds uh, in place. So what about number six? All right. Okay, this is going to be short and sweet. It's a good thing that you all have such great ideas because we got stuck in the weeds with one idea. So, um, our main idea was expansion of the wedding business and groups business. Um, for multiple reasons, of course, they bring several people with them when they come. Um, a lot of the att attendees of probably more of weddings than reunions are young. And so that takes care of that whole young, the dynamics of that and exposing them to Estes Park and, and to the National Park. Um, it can become a year round economy um, or it promotes that. Um, it opens it up to the possibility of future reservations because they come, they love it. Why wouldn't you? And you come back. And it also promotes and encourages uh, partnerships with other service providers, Absolutely. whether it be hotels or, you know, wedding providers or venues, other venues. So that, those were the, the pluses. Um, really, the only restrictive we came up with was that sometimes businesses are resistant in sharing the wealth and they don't want to play, you know, so that might be a reason that it wouldn't be successful. But are, are there other thoughts of, of um, and I'm not sure what scale that is today, but other factors that have inhibited more wedding activity in, in Estes Park? Anything that comes to your mind? Yeah. We have a really solid wedding association right now that's been in existence for about 11 years and I think there's probably a half a dozen um, leaders from that group in this room right now. But um, in, in effect, we are a group of volunteers and we do the best we can at organizing, marketing, building websites, doing social media, but that's not our main business. It's what we do to contribute. So if we could have some collaboration that came from other organizations hmm. that would help us raise up, yep. we would be able to attract more business here that would have a lot more expansiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, Lois is 
founding member. <laughs> Okay, so I remember the first time we approached the town board in 2000, 2000, the association started in 2001, and I sat with the advertising marketing committee and they said, no, if we start attracting, if we start putting marketing dollars towards <coughs> weddings, that's not fair to the fly fishermen and the handicapped one-legged bird watchers that, um, so I'm, I'm honestly so thrilled to say that this association has done so well, and some of it by accident. You know, jokingly, our first goal was to get on Oprah. We never achieved that, but um, hey, there's still, you know, some places out there. We can do it. Um, but I think, again, I want to applaud the idea that we're looking at other ideas today instead of saying, okay, no, not weddings because we, that's too targeted. I think we do need to be targeted in our market. And I think that in the past has been one of the things that's held us back is identifying what targets are out there that are primed to be aimed at and we could go after them. So again, if we can get past our whatevers, and start thinking about, boy, we could even put Made in Estes as a tagline on the weddings. I mean, you know, we started in Estes. And made in Estes. The babies that come. Homegrown, <laughs> yes. The anniversaries, the honeymoons. Or, uh, yeah, homegrown, not corporate owned. <laughs> other, uh, other thoughts on the weddings? Yep. Yeah. Even getting more targeted, yeah. Lois, than that was, was we. There was some discussion we had with the owner of Rocky Mountain, uh, Rocky Mountain Park Inn, and when we're looking at expanding the conference center, which is something we haven't mentioned, but I think improvements to the conference center is something that should be on the list there too. It could definitely use it in some expansion. Yeah. But they were talking about um, Forever Resorts and had a, a great experience with kosher kitchens. Mm -hmm. That if and they talked about putting in a kosher kitchen there, there are no. Um, as far as, as they know, no kosher kitchens that serve weddings in the mountains in Colorado. Hmm. Um, and, the, and to go after that niche of um, the Jewish weddings and bar mitzvahs and other things, um, apparently, the wedding folks probably know better than I do, but apparently when they do that, they actually bring in kosher meals, but basically it's a kosher TV dinner for a wedding, which is, I mean, they do it, but that's all they can do. They thought if, if we had that Oops. niche, of somewhere, if one of the restaurants or one of the places could be in a true kosher kitchen, then we could go out for that market hmm. as well. That's interesting. Great. Did you? Oh. Wendy and I were talking, and we thought a good idea would be <laughs> <laughs> that uh, all new babies born in the Estes Park Hospital would be tattooed made in Estes. Uh, all right, all right, yeah, that's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I, you know me, I talk too much. I, just one thing I would like to throw out there, and I don't want to be a negative Annie, but um, when we talk about developing fine arts and the new, the new event center, I want to make sure we go into stuff with a little more forward thought. And many of you know that my son does light and sound and my son has done many events in the new event center and is so frustrated that it is not a building for concerts. I'm sorry people, it's a metal building. It was not designed with the forethought for sound hmm. and music and maybe some other people can stand up with me here and say they agree, but let's not make that mistake again. Um, we want to do it right when we do it um, and we really want to think about what we're developing and put the right components into whatever it is we're developing. Well, that uh, certainly is a, a key point. And if, if you're going to that effort on the create side and you're, and you're developing, you, you better have clarity in terms of what really does work and what is sort of so-so uh, along that line. Well, let's uh, finish up uh, number seven. Um, all right. 
Last but not least, right? Our group is not least. A a absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm speaking for the group. Um, the first thing is not a product, but we thought it was important. Um, there are ambassadors working in the visitor center, but uh, and this isn't a new idea, but we thought it was important for everyone in town to be an ambassador for the town and for everyone to be treated as a guest, and that was a training opportunity for every frontline worker to know what's available and could answer the question, what is there to do in town? Um, the next is kind of a, a product, in a sense, although it's using what currently exists. So the, we have all kinds of things that are, that are available, but we don't have coordinated themed experiences for the most part. We have you know, individual events, and it, it would be a great opportunity to tie things together. We've already talked about art walks, uh, craft beverage walks, and so on. But there is a global market now of what you might call walkabouts, where people from all over the world want to go to walk through Ireland or walk through Italy or something like that. We could have the same thing here in Estes Park, and it could be walking through the various environments, Alpine, Montaigne, subalpine and so on in the park. The park is one of the things that's most unique and isn't replicable any place else. But you know, we, we could take better advantage of that in terms of themed things. That would also cross-link with food, events, and so on and so forth. Uh, and finally, the thing that's going to happen already, the breweries and distilleries, the craft beverages, we thought that was a great opportunity to uh, take better advantage of that. In the medium term, take, taking better advantage of the event center, uh, that'll take a bit of, of time. And we already talked about the need to have more children and family friendly, friendly things. It's great of uh, Bill Ullman to offer that the Y would staff that center <laughs> downtown. That would certainly satisfy a need Don't there. Lie. And then finally, <laughs> and then finally, in, in, in the long term, we have the, the infrastructure needs that really the town addresses broadband, roads, parking, traffic, water, and so on and so forth for the long-term success of, of our destination. Those things will, will be important. So uh, anyone else in our group would like to add anything, please do. Well, great. Um, you know, just sitting here on the listening side, um, pretty intriguing, just the, the diversity, the, the mix of ideas and, and the concepts, and thinking about this of only spending uh, an hour or so and getting the right heads, thinking creatively, um, lots of opportunities. And then the, the challenge, the issue now is, okay, um, what do we do with some of these thoughts? How do we try and prioritize uh, some of these? How do we try and move uh, some of the right ones forward? Yeah, Ron. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a, a comment as we move into that next phase. With the exception of the public infrastructure, which we have plans and mechanisms in place for funding, the big question for any of these other things that require investment is where is the money going to yep. come from? Yeah. And we don't have anything in place. We don't have an urban renewal authority, a downtown <coughs> development authority. We don't have a benefactor that will give us $50 million. So that's one of the key barriers that, that we've got to address if we're going to make some of these non-public infrastructure things happen. That's obviously critically important in, in recognizing that, that cost side of the, uh, of the equation. What's interesting, though, I, I think there were quite a number of ideas that, that came out that didn't have a, a big price ticket. And, um, but along that, that lines, I do think one of the discussions will have to be, are there new funding uh, approaches? Are there, like some of the other communities, is there a bed tax solution where some new resources could be generated and dedicated to these kinds of, of efforts? But certainly that has to be front and center in terms of what are some of the tools that we can put in our, our toolbox to try and, and make some of these, uh, these concepts. If we can't fund it, we can't do it. Yeah, I yeah, understand, certainly. Well, um, you guys have been really good in terms of um, keeping attention and, and participating. Um, we've got just a, uh, maybe another 20, 30 minutes just to sort of wrap uh, things up here this afternoon. And what we wanted to do was, was to, to close in terms of, of talking about 
um, in my mind, some pretty good momentum. We've covered a lot of ground in, in a single day uh, here today. And the issue is how do we keep some of this momentum uh, going forward? How do we think about some next steps? So um, I think what's, what's going to be most important is the need to, to formalize some type of coordinating entity. I'm, I'm calling it a tourism product development committee or, or commission. And just in the couple of examples that we talked about earlier, whether Asheville or um, Scottsdale, is it a, a part of the, the CDB? Is it a, a, a separate um, entity that's appointed by the, the council? Lots of different ways that that can be structured. But I do think uh, we need to have that kind of entity with that very clear responsibility and an ongoing role that that tourism uh, product development commission or committee has this responsibility to carry these kinds of, of thinking and that discussion of, that, of the proactive uh, 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 product development thinking uh, forward. Question? Yes. Um, in, in your experience, what level of funding is necessary for an organization like that to be effective even at an entry level? You know, I. I don't have a, a good off the, the, the cuff answer for you. Let me give some, some thought to that and, and I'll, I'll get back with some ideas with Elizabeth. But I think part of that, uh, quite a number of destinations will, will start with trying to, to work and as we were talking about Asheville having the CDB uh, staff and so there is some limited incremental uh, staff costs, there's not a whole new organization and office space and all of those kinds of things. It's essentially uh, the, the commission getting together um, oftentimes in the early part monthly for a number of months to get things structured and formalized and then meeting maybe four times a year with much of the uh, resources being uh, staffed. And then um, as I was saying one of the limiting um, issues is if we're asking uh, a CDB to undertake that kind of role but with zero, um, oftentimes if, if there can be some kind of, and, and bed taxes is, is typically, you know, some have looked at food and beverage tax, um, which is a much more difficult one to, uh, to move forward. There are some different uh, approaches there, but I'll, I'll, I'll think a little bit more as far as what's that, that sort of minimum uh, threshold. But I do think that there can be a fair amount, not that we're actually funding new projects, but we're, we're using volunteer brain power and thinking, trying to prioritize, thinking about recruiting, uh, thinking about what projects are we going to advocate on behalf of. And those kinds of roles don't take a whole lot of, of resources. Certainly when you, when you get into the, uh, the, the points that Ron was, was talking about with major sticks and bricks and, and um, those kinds of, of costs, those, that capital availability becomes a, a much more important point. But I do think that you're, um, you're going to be able to continue and, and make some strides without a whole lot of incremental resources at least to, to start with and at least to keep some of this momentum uh, moving forward. So trying to expand on David's question, in my mind, uh, it's not going to be the resources because we have lots of volunteers and we have people who, you know, work so hard and they'll still find more time to volunteer. <laughs> um, it's going to be the money. It's going to be, so in your experience on the ones you've told us about, where did they get the money? Because we can all meet and talk till we're blue in the face, but yep. if yep. there's no money, we've already, you know, raised taxes, you know, we've already done a lot of that kind of sort. So where would the money come from? Yeah. I haven't done the analysis, and, and Elizabeth, you might have some of this insight as far as your, your bid tax rate and how you're positioned competitively with some of the competitive set. And, and John, can you maybe speak to? So I wanted to speak first to what we have today. And um, Elizabeth is the chair of the Destination Product Development Committee, which has initially been focused on the Downtown Loop Project. But that involves folks from Visit Estes Park, uh, in a variety of sectors, including the town, in an ex officio role. And our current budget for Estes Park EDC, we included $40,000 this year for a variety of projects. It's not all committed to that. And we've only committed 
2000 thus far to the Wellness Summit, which is also being sponsored by Visit Estes Park and the different business associations and the hospital and the Stanley Hotel. But we have kind of have an informal mechanism. The question is, when you get to a funding mechanism that comes out of that, what will that look like? So I think we kind of, and I welcome Elizabeth's input on this, but I think we at least have the beginnings of something to coordinate a pretty broad-based group. And I might just echo, I, I think that's typically the most logical, that, that there's a, a close association and affiliation with, with the DMO. Agree. Moving forward, it's important that the town board and town staff and Visit Estes Park and EDC and the area associations that encompass that, which includes EVPC, the Wedding Association, and ELA primarily. Um, but I really don't see any of this moving forward without all of us at the table, and that doesn't mean we have a 30-person committee, but um, the EDC, Destination Product Development Committee, um, is a fairly good cross-section, and we could grow that. Um, Frank is currently an ex-officio on that committee, and it would be great to have additional staff or town board um, join that committee if we decide to move forward. I think initially, you know, we need to have some conversations with the town to see what direction they'd like to go in and what they're excited about and what, um, you know, realistically they think is within our means, and then uh, growing into a committee would make sense. The um, have you done any analysis as far as your the your bed, bed tax rate and how you compare? Yeah, we're currently researching across the country, but certainly focusing on Colorado, the bed tax. We've known um, ever since we put it on the ballot that the 2% was very very small compared to other destinations, and certainly small compared to destinations our size. Um, we pack a pretty powerful punch with that 2% based on the size of this destination and what we're expected to do with it, um, but we're definitely restricted by that budget. Um, a quarter of our budget is spent on events, which is uh, worthy of that attention. It's going to buy us time until this destination product development piece is in place. But we do fall short from an international standpoint and group standpoint, and it, it, we fall short because of funding, not because of want or desire. Um, so there's a lot of growth on the table, um, not just from destination product development standpoint, but there's other opportunities for this community as well. We'll continue to do that research, and. You know, if there are discussions about um, campaigning for an additional one or two or what have you percent to the bed tax, it will be launched with deliverables of here's what uh, additional funds would create opportunity-wise for this community. We'd be very specific about that so this destination understood um, what the expectation was if, if they did vote for it. Elizabeth just raises a, a really important point. The the ones that we've seen uh, as successful has that clarity when it's not just um, um, another point or another two points. It's this is what how these new resources are going to be allocated. Here's the kind of return on investment we're hoping to achieve, or the new kinds of, of uh, a room night generation that, that we would hope to be able to generate. But having that in place, I, I think, is really critical. One of the things we looked at in launching Estes Park EDC was different funding mechanisms. We didn't particularly look at DMO-centered funding, but when you start looking at tax increment financing, whether it's a downtown development authority or URA, those are usually very defined geographically. Correct. Yep. One of the things that's appealing about the idea of, of the DMO leading it is it's a larger district and it gives you more Flexibility. flexibility. Absolutely. And it also, because of the funding mechanism, you don't have the issues where the school district, the county, the hospital are saying, we don't like it coming out of the property tax and, and that type of thing. Absolutely. And I think that's why the, the majority of these are uh, funded through some form of, of a bed tax uh, type of, of orientation. California with some of the T bids and some of those um, geographic uh, oriented can be a little bit different. When uh, Visit Estes Park was initially formed, actually it was called the local marketing district, the focus was on marketing Estes Park. What I'm hearing is it's beginning to evolve into something else, which is uh, supporting the growth and well-being and businesses as well. And uh, 
also listening to Elizabeth talk a minute ago it's, as a potential mechanism for funding uh, the growth of businesses, not just of marketing. So th this puts a different spin on things, and I think one of the things uh, that we need to do is sit down and talk about the role of the, uh, the EDC and uh, visit Estes Park, how we collaborate. What, what is the, what's the end game? What's the real goal that we're after, and how do we want to go about uh, achieving it? I would say the, the end goal was there'd be some formalization of a tourism development committee commission that would have an ongoing life. And that entity, part of it would be fostering with some tools in their toolbox of the, of the right projects, but part of it would be um, this type of, of dialogue and, and discussion of how do we um, uh, um, direct some of the right kinds of uh, projects. In many instances, in, in Asheville's example, as we were saying, just about any new tourism product comes before the, the, the product um, commission and looks to get at least their, their advocacy vote, if, if not a, a financial uh, stake, but that this entity would have an ongoing role and would have basically the opportunity to weigh in on early stage projects and try and give uh, direction, insight, thoughts in terms of how that product could be developed or, or refined to meet some of the broader goals that the community um, uh, possesses and has. I just want to reinforce a point. We do need to get together. Uh, there are several key roles that several key players already have in this community. The town has a lead role on public infrastructure. EDC has a, a lead role in uh, particularly working with the private economic sector and Visit Estes working on the tourism sector. We each have a lead in that. What we need to do is get together and clarify our respective roles and where the overlaps are and make sure we know who's going to do what and that we agree on that before we go charging down the road. Yeah. And, and, and those discussions and dialogues can oftentimes take you know, a, a while to, uh, um, but there has to be a fundamental agreement on the need of moving in the direction, uh, an agreement on the, 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 the broad direction that this kind of entity would, would, would play. And that's what we wanted to, you know, sort of set the broad stage this afternoon, not answering that, that question of who plays exactly what role, but somehow we need to formalize more this type of, of entity. And then, uh, Elizabeth, you, you touched on some of the composition that, that you've got right now, but very important to have that broad representation of some of the, the, the key different uh, groups. Whoever is, is taking the, the lead role, that there are the different voices of the, of the various entities and as well uh, the various thematic areas. So there is somebody th who's speaking on behalf of the arts and culture side on the outdoor recreation side. So really thinking about that composition and representation of that entity uh, can oftentimes take a, a fair amount of time to make sure you've got the, the, the right folks on that group. And then the reporting responsibility. Does it go reporting back to the CVB? Does it go back and report to the council? But those are exactly the, the points that you brought up, Ron, in terms of those would, would have to be determined and, um, and evaluated. Sure. So Elizabeth probably already knows the answer to this, but um, of the areas that you would identify as our competitors, what proportion of them have a something like a tourism product development organization in place? And maybe you could tell us nationally. I mean, if this is a, if this is a critical path requirement, that's important for us to know, I think. I can tell you in some of the work that DMAI has done, and um, and th there's a whole continu continuum of how deep uh, some of the various, but it's about half of the, of the DMOs around the country um, have uh, an active product development um, role, and again, that can vary pretty significantly, but it's about 50%, and that's sort of where we started this discussion. It's still sort of early stage um, for uh, a lot, and there still are quite a number that have not gotten into this, um, into this space. Just another thought on, on funding mechanisms. The existing destination product development committee is, is pretty much advisory. Yep. Um, but as you start looking at different funding mechanisms, they all have their own requirements, rules, restrictions. So 
if, if you use some of these existing statutory elements, whether it's a business improvement district, a URA, or whatever, you have certain options within that, and urban renewal authorities generally have a lot of flexibility on, on their tools compared to some of the others. Um, so there's just a lot of moving factors that you have to look at in terms of what are the existing statutory frameworks for how to fund different things. David, I can't give you a specific stats to answer that question, but I've done a fair amount of research even before I accepted this position because pro destination product development is a pattern that I had seen two years ago, three years ago, and um, it probably started when Estes Park dropped from three to five and Breckenridge and Boulder beat us out. It bothered me, I wanted to know why, and that's when I started looking into other destinations and how they did move um, forward, overcoming some of their challenges, because even the destinations that we're comparing ourselves to that are healthy or we consider healthy have had these same challenges. Um, so they've all been around a table similar to us, but yes, I have seen these destinations have similar committees that Mitch has described to us today. Um, since I've had this position, I've reached out to other destinations. Um, it started when I was looking into the event coordinator position to see if that would be a healthy topic for this community. And reached, I called Val and Breckenridge and Keystone and Boulder and Durango and Montrose and had discussions about not just events, but their economic drivers and how they were getting there. Glenwood Springs is another. Um, Glenwood's quite similar to us. They had, they were pretty equal as far as um, challenged with the ski, the skiers just passing them by. And they put together a group that, very similar to this, um, and then they started attracting developers and investors and manufacturers to build the infrastructure that group agreed to. And now Glenwood Springs is doing incredibly well and they're continuing to build on that infrastructure. And they didn't sell their soul, you know, they've put in infrastructure that um, the residents were comfortable with and are enjoying that as well. So I see it repeatedly over and over again. Um, it's why we're focusing on this sooner rather than later. My job would be much easier only nine months in to just ride the wave of the perfect trifecta of three centennials, but I worry about five, six, ten years down the road now. Um, we'll continue to do the marketing we always have been doing. That will never be compromised at all. And I have to tell you, our staff is just incredible. They push that marketing dollar for every penny. It's unbelievable how hard they work and how far ahead we are from other DMOs from a marketing standpoint. And if we did not have that team, there's no way we'd be in this room today. So having spent nine months with this team, knowing that they had that intact and they continue to educate themselves by ongoing online seminars to attending conferences around the country, um, they've got it dialed in and we continue to dial that in and recently brought on an agency partner to make sure that we can be accountable for every penny of our marketing dollars. So as that continues and my comfort level was raised based on that's working, I still have oversight obviously. Um, I knew we had the time to look into this and see if the community was open to it um, along with the town board and just um, evaluate our options. And, if we have options and a funding source, that's all needs, that all needs to be determined. We're not making that decision today, but this was really the first step in deciding, um, is this a conversation we all want to have and um, would we like to continue it? And if I can, can just echo Elizabeth, because I, I do think that is the real goal of today, to bring some consensus about the, the importance of trying to move into the space to try and take on this, this product development role. How do we do it? Start a, a discussion and dialogue about some of the different ideas and concepts uh, that the, um, uh, the partners and the community has. And then just begin discussing you know, how is this entity structured? What kinds of tools or resources might it have? Obviously, we're not gonna get that resolved today, but there has to be some agreement that this is a space, this is an area that we as a destination, we as a community need to move more fully on, and that you know, to, 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 to move this, we've gotta start having deeper discussions on these other structural areas and tool areas and priority 
uh, areas, but for uh, a single day for us to have covered a fair amount of ground and, and hopefully as we leave today um, have some heads nodding that um, this is the right direction. We do need to be taking uh, this uh, on more proactively and we need to uh, pursue some of the direction that we're outlining here as far as next steps. I'd like to hear either Jim Pickering or John Nicholas talk about the role of the EDC and how different what we're hearing today is uh, from what the EDC is trying to do or under the EDC mm -hmm. umbrella. Good. I have a deferential boss. Um, <laughs> Uh, basically, uh, when the EDC was first formed, uh, the two major areas we thought about were business attraction, business retention and expansion, and um, we were really focused on the idea of, of diversification uh, of businesses. Uh, as we've gotten into the process, especially post-flood, we've focused a lot more really on community development issues, and so we... we I mean, we've helped breweries and distilleries a little bit, and we've talked to other people who are bringing businesses here, but um, as part of rolling out our strategy this year, we've engaged Avalanche Consulting out of Austin, Texas, and um, yesterday when I spoke to one of our consultants, he'd lost his voice because it's South by Southwest right now, <laughs> so <laughs> a lot of discussions going on there. but. But the basic idea is to look globally at the overall economic health. And I'm, I'm starting to see that we, we need to partner with Visit Estes Park and kind of let them take more of a lead on the tourism side of it because they frankly have a, a more in-depth understanding of the destination. But we do have to work on how do we work in tandem. And there are certain tools that the town can access that Visit Estes Park, Park can access and that we can access that all need to be part of the mix. Adding? I'll just add a couple of things. I'll just add a couple of comments. Uh, as you know, the Avalanche survey closed down yesterday. Uh, we had 795 responders, which we think is absolutely excellent in a community which tends to survey people from time to time on one thing or another. I think when those comments uh, are, are brought into context with the strategic plan, we will have some of the answers to the questions that have been raised today. Uh, and we certainly will go back to them during their visits and in discussions which you will all have an opportunity to have with them, I think this is a wonderful time to intersect these comments today into what they're doing for us as a community. Good. So the timing is just terrific. Great. Well, let me just flip through a, a couple of other um, points. Um, you know, we, we've started laying some of the foundation today and understanding some of those critical issues and SWAT factors and development concepts. And so now, in terms of moving forward, it's all about acting on that strategic foundation. And whether it's EDC and how we connect and how, uh, what are some of the potential funding sources, that's where we need to, to move forward. So I think first we need to develop a strategic framework that would identify new tourism development opportunity areas and associated criteria to be used in prioritizing those new initiatives. So this new commission would take some of the ideas that, that came out of the, the session today, others, and thinking uh, about what are some of the key criteria that we, you know, given these SWAT factors, given um, our existing tourism uh, products and our drivers and our accelerants, what are some of the key criteria that we want to evaluate these new concepts, these new ideas on a going forward kind of basis? Um, and so some additional work will need to be done from you know, SWAT, evaluation, criteria development, those kinds of things, but building on some of the dialogue that we've had uh, today. As some of that criteria has been then developed, identify uh, new products and, and associated steps that could be used to attract them along with capable development entities. And I, I, I just want to reinforce, and I know I've said this a couple of times, the, the capital and the resources and the tools is important. Um, but I, I think as important, maybe even more important, is for the community to have clarity in terms of 
what they want, where they want, and how they're going out and trying to convince other development entities, uh, other financial uh, entities, of why they should be thinking about Estes Park. So I think a lot of that heavy lifting can be done even if there's just some, some limited resources to, to start out with. So as the findings of the assessment initiative is completed, then the, the TDC would identify approaches that could be considered to proactively approach the right new products and development entities, and a set of targeted criteria would be developed to help in prioritizing prospective new um, opportunities. And, and we've, we've said this numerous times today, but rather than waiting for them to find us to spark, we're, we're doing the heavy lifting as a community and going out and proactively trying to uh, recruit and convince them that, that Estes Park is the, is the right uh, answer, the right solution. Um, third then, as we're considering existing destination products that are in a transition stage, so it's not only new things and going out and recruiting, but it's also looking at um, existing products and are there some of those existing enhancement uh, opportunities that we've begun scratching the surface on here today and working to maximize their future potential from a broad destination-wide perspective. And when I'm talking a broad destination-wide perspective, oftentimes the owner of an individual product is just looking at what they might do to enhance from a very narrow kind of perspective. And if this kind of entity can say, well, you know, there's really a broader opportunity and if we did X, Y, and Z, and that would be a very important role of this kind of entity, this kind of council. Um, and then respond to new prospective products. And, and I can't reinforce how important I think this role of this entity uh, as other development entities, as other concepts uh, are envisioned, that they would come and present some of their ideas, some of their concepts to this Tourism Product Development Commission early on in their planning stages and have the benefit of some of the best heads in the community give them feedback on, well, you know, you should think about this or, or what about teaming with uh, this element or that element. So in some instances it's recruiting, in some instances it's enhancing, in some instances it's responding to other potential new projects that are already on in that planning stage and giving them uh, the right kind of direction. And finally, uh, what we've started to scratch the surface on uh, develop some new incentive tools that could help in stimulating the targeted new development uh, <coughs> initiatives. And like any development effort, a variety of incentives can help uh, facilitate that, and whether it's a bed tax, um, whether it's, it's some other uh, opportunity, that is, is certainly uh, something that's going to have to be investigated. But I would just challenge you in terms of uh, I think there can be a lot of momentum and a lot of progress that can be made without having a huge war chest behind you. And I, uh, I, I, I think we have to be cautious about getting stuck in the mud of saying, well, we, we don't have that, that big uh, money, um, and so we're, we're not undertaking some of the things that we began here today in terms of having the community come together and understand where the real opportunities are and how we start trying to proactively attract and build and, and act on those right activities. So we've, we've um, covered a, a lot of ground um, here today and um, uh, for a, a single day thinking about uh, why and, and I, I might pose a, a pretty fundamental question back to the group. Do we have consensus that, that this is a, an area that makes sense that we need to be uh, moving and pursuing uh, more deeply? Is there a fundamental agreement on, on that? Do we, are there people that are still unconvinced that this is a, a, a direction we, that we need to be thinking about or, or considering? No, 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 just, just uh, you know, uh, voice or thoughts. I'm curious where people think we're at on that curve. Your very first yep, slide yep, showed yep. the curve. Where do people think we are on that curve? Ah, uh, there you go. Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious where, you know, we started talking, we talked about are we, you know, we've hit consolidation. So where do we think we're at? You know, when we first started talking about the slide, we talked about 
making it through consolidation um, post flood, did we get to the decline? Did we get to stagnation? I think Diane has a really important question and it's hard to measure because we had fires in 2012, we had the flood in 2013. 2014 was a good year, but it was a better year for some of the other resorts. So for me, I kind of feel like we're either at consolidation or we're at the top of the roller coaster trying to decide if we're gonna keep going up or, or go down. I think for somebody who's been here for about three, three and a half years now, just since the time that I've been here, um, and actually Frank and I have been here the same amount of time within about uh, two or three months. So just in the time that I've been here, um, I have seen our shoulder seasons getting a little bit longer. I've also seen us, you know, like John said, with the fire and the flood and things like that. But I can also see how we can start to go into decline if we don't start looking at long-term visioning and where we want to be and how we get there. Um, sometimes I say that if we don't change, and, and this is an exaggeration, but I say we can be a one gas station town and a, and a one diner town of a typical 6,000 year round population and that's not where we want to be, but that's where we will be if, if we refuse to do some things. So I think we're up there near the top I think we're still climbing a little bit, but I think we, I think, you know, I can see how we could go into the decline. Because there's if, a fork in the road. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think the rejuvenation and the long-term visioning and product destination um, um, things are very important. Other thoughts? Is, yep. I, I, I think I, I take a more positive view in terms mm -hmm. of uh, the things that we're doing, and I say that from the standpoint of the town, the money that we're investing in uh, projects, uh, in infrastructure, uh, and uh, I heard a comment about the, uh, the event center, but at the same time, that's a step towards a year-round economy. I think the things that are going on with the wellness center and the Stanley, again, another step in the right direction to expanding our economy. And uh, I also look at the fact that we've got the, the, this group of people in this room that are focused on the future and are going to do those things uh, that will help us to grow. We had an interesting experience a couple years ago when we had the fires, uh, or excuse me, the, well, the fires, that was interesting too. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the, uh, the flood was really a big event for this community because one of the things that it did, it brought us all together. I think there was, uh, all the petty crap just went away and people said, how are we, how are we gonna pull out of this? How are, are we gonna make things better? And I think that that attitude is the attitude that I see around this table. So I would say we're on our way up. I agree with everything that, uh, that Bill has just said. If you look at and I believe that we're further along on rejuvenation than a lot of us give credit for because a lot of things we're seeing, even pre-flood, are starting to pay off at this point in time. But I, I go specifically to April of last year where we talk about rundown infrastructure and we had a, a vote to increase our sales tax and it was two to one. And the citizens are obviously supporting the types of things that we're talking about. Not that we don't have to talk about it more and see the implementation of some of these ideas, but I think we're well along the rejuvenation. Great. Okay, now that my three bosses, three of my bosses have said we're doing really well. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my contract is up to review in the next two weeks. <laughs> yeah. I think we're at the apex and we're, if anything, we're, we're very close to that fork. Yep. Um, I think we're making a lot of progress. It's very encouraging. I think it's encouraging that we're talking about it. Um, what would be scary is we're not, if we were in decline and weren't talking about it. Right. But I think we're very close to that. We've fallen from the number three, uh, number one visitor, visitor location in Colorado to number three, or to number five. Um, 
I personally am very concerned about the condition of the buildings downtown. Um, I'm not seeing the private reinvestment in the infrastructure. To be honest with you, uh, some of the buildings down there are in terrible shape and nobody's working on them. There's a lot behind the scenes. Um, you know, there's a few buildings down there that I just think I would not be surprised to come in someday and they just fall over. Um, do you have any in I do, but I'm not going to say. <laughs> um, but the part we fixed is going to be fine. Um, but there, there, there are some things that I'm not seeing that kind of turnaround. There's still a lot of, um, I think, uh, arguments back and forth. Um, I was just peeking here. There's a land use hearing going on right now. It's been going on now for almost four hours. Um, some very adamant ap opposition to the wellness center um, changes that they're putting in, and that's you know there's still those that kind of attitude out there. Um, we do have some very different populations. We have the working groups, we have the visitors, people who are um, in guest services, but we have a retirement community and people who've been here a long time that um, don't want to see things change. So I think we're at a crossroads. Um, with that said, I'm very positive about that because we're having those discussions. There's a lot of really positive energy. I think this board has seen leadership and, and sees some direction. Um, as the visit us as park board and other entities to, to move ahead, to have the vision to build the, the event center. Um, that, that was a reach for the town, I think. Um, and that's, that's something we're heading, moving ahead with, with Epic, a lot of other things. Uh, what, the way we responded to the, uh, to the brewery, brewery issue uh, and the microbrews, the board responded very quickly to respond to that. I think they're looking really hard at improving where we are with development codes and making improvements there. Um, but I think we're at that crossroads. Um, I think it's very possible to, um, with some, that some of the negativity caught on, um, it could push us the other way. We've got an issue coming up here quickly with the, they talked about the outside uh, uh, beer garden. You know, I know there was some opposition to that. Some of the opposition was, well, we don't want it because it'll be competition. Well, if we don't bring anything new in because it's competition for something existing, then we might as well just shut the doors right now. Another complaint we got was, well, I had to go through a lot more hoops than they're having to. Well, that should be a good thing. <laughs> that meant that the town was responding and we're making the development process easier. Because it was difficult for you, we shouldn't then make it difficult for everybody else. But that, those kind of comments are out there. And so I, I think there's some of the population that doesn't buy into this. They, they're not drinking the Kool-Aid. And um, if, if they take the, uh, the momentum, there's a possibility we can slide downhill. So I, I don't think we have to sit on our laurels. We need to work really hard to keep the word rejuvenation. We're in a good place to start, but I'd say we're right there at that split, split in the road. Good. You have a comment? I just wanted to say that I have the opportunity to see the competition down I-70 at trade shows where Steamboat, Vail, Breckenridge, even Longmont's at and we need to go behind this because they've already gone through this this process and they're aggressive and they're getting our business so i think this is a phenomenal way to go we have to move with the times great the two points I'd, I'd, I'd like to reinforce one is is your point of don't get caught in that focus of it's just about what's happening within within estes park because it's absolutely critically important of what are our key competitors doing and are they moving the uh, the bar and even if we're staying staying still we're, we're in essence falling back and the the difference of uh, of thoughts and opinions on on where we stand i think frankly is a is a good thing because you know, if, if there was clear consensus that we're definitely on that decline, we will have waited too long. And, and so it's, in, in my mind, sort of a, a good orientation that there's some different um, thinking, but uh, at the same time, some real caveats. That, that boy, that, that, can cur that can turn negative. And if there isn't this kind of proactive steps and thinking about how we reinvent, how we renew um, and, and formalize that process, Personally, I, I think you're, you're, you're putting a fair amount at risk and you, you're going to have other more aggressive competitors have a, a, a really strong opportunity to pull market share uh, away from what could have been Estes Park. Yeah. Can I talk beforehand? There's no way. <laughs> 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 He's hardly had the mic. Uh. <laughs> 
fact, I got text messages, but I was feeling okay because I've kept my mouth shut. Um, I just wanted to say just a quick comment to give Frank some cover because I think you're exactly right. Uh, I think we are at the juncture. We've had a lot of foundation building, which is very positive. I think that probably is what you're referring to there. Uh, we have a long road in front of us, and we need to continue building the momentum, the community support, uh, addressing funding, coordinating uh, everything between what the Economic Development Corporation and Visit Estes Park are already doing, what the town's initiatives are, whether it's in uh, particularly the event center. We've all invested substantially financially as a community, and we've not yet seen the payback. It's the very beginning of that. So a lot of these initiatives are just beginning to have payback. If we lose community support, if we fail to to take the follow-up steps, uh, then we will slide back into that possible decline. Other communities, as Karen pointed out, are ahead of us in this, this task. I think we can play catch up pretty fast. The, the, the Today's discussion, the people participating, a lot of the other committees that have been formed and are addressing everything from workforce housing to you know, the, the other critical impediments that have kept some of these things from moving forward. We just can't lose that momentum because we are at that fork. And uh, I, you know, I'm happy to hear our town manager acknowledge and recognize that, that it, everything's not in just rose-colored glasses. There's, there's a lot of work in front of us, and I hope all of us will commit to do it. <laughs> that was a new record. <laughs> I actually don't have anything to add other than to back up uh, or to endorse what Frank said. Uh, to be a little bit contrary, I think four years ago we were actually on the decline stage and I think um, the changes in community leadership in the past four years have been magnificent. I think they have been enhanced by a couple of blessings that did not feel very good such as a flood and fires. So we've been forced into change. At any rate, I, to, to the folks at the table, I say thank you, because now I think we're, we're on that curve, or at least we're at the apex. But four years ago, I felt like we were, we were in dire straits. I just want to go back to the original question that you asked, um, which is, which was, do we all agree or disagree on moving in the direction we're moving in? And I'm probably the newest resident of Estes Park, and I have been overwhelmed with the commitment to progress that I see. The committees that I serve on, uh, the EDC's commitment to researching bringing an avalanche, bringing a community together, this forum today that Elizabeth put together, the Sid Springer and her commitment, the meeting next week that she's pulling together to have input from the town. So if you ask me, do we need another organization to make this, to continue this process, I don't have an answer to that. But I do know there are organizations already doing it and I don't think that's going to go away. I don't see these folks saying we're, we're status quo is okay. So I, I'm, I applaud this community. I've, I've lived all over the world. I've never seen the kind of commitment to progress and to economic development that I've seen here in the few months I've been here. And thank you for that because I think this community has a lot to be proud of and I'm very proud of our board for all being here and the progress we have made because I and I'm glad to hear you be optimistic because I think it's important for all of us to hear that but I would agree we could easily slide back I mean it's too easy to say and we've got fertile ground right now and we do have a lot of influencers and leaders committed but we do have detractors and people who want to decelerate us they want us to stop and it's serious business. This is the livelihood of our community. So I'm so glad we're here in this forum today. Yeah, right behind. I, you know, I don't see this necessarily as a glass half full or half empty kind of thing. I, I do believe we are on that edge. But I think for the first time in a very long time, we're at least looking in the right direction. You know, we're not on that road yet, but we're looking at that road. 
and we're not afraid of the hurdles anymore. This is a room full of uh, <clears throat> positive, forward-looking people. And as soon as this meeting's over, I think we should run downtown and support a gentleman <laughs> who's putting a lot of money up to make it happen. So I'm not looking at this life cycle, I think, like most people in the room. Um, I'm not looking at nearly as black and white as most people. Um, because everybody's kind of looking at that juncture where it's rejuvenation or decline. And I'm kind of reading through this, I don't have my glasses on, but I'm reading through this as much as I can. And everyone's talking, the way everybody's talking, I almost think that the development section of that needs to be way more closer to where we think we are going because I think Estes Park is still in this development stage. We're doing a lot of that. We have a rapid visitor growth because in the lodging section, everybody that's on that sector right now is talking about this coming year being one of the biggest years they've seen in a long time. Um, we are building more attractions, or we're at least talking about building more attractions. Um, you know, there are a lot of things, getting outside investors, things like that. We're still, I don't want to say we're still in, but we're moving back toward that development stage, and not that we're sliding back toward that, because I don't want to say we're sliding back toward that, because that doesn't mean we're doing bad. That just means we're trying to move in toward a direction that makes us just park better. And so I don't think, to be honest with you, in the black and white phase of this, uh -huh. I don't think development for Estes Park as a general is in the right area because I think we are in a development stage. We're in a new phase of development, which will bring us into a rejuvenation stage. <coughs> That's Good, yep. Well, I, I, I think what I'm, as we, as we wrap up here, what's, what's um, I hope everyone is, is left with, is that this is a, involved in, in, frankly, a pretty messy process that can take months and months and, and frankly, uh, years. But it, at some point, there has to be the catalyst that says we need to take steps and we need to start this ball rolling down. We have to take this proactive role in tourism uh, product development. And I, I think across the, the board, it's not that we've answered all the questions or, or resolved all, all of the issues, but I do think we've, we've covered uh, a lot of ground uh, today in a, in a single day, uh, uh, addressed a, a lot of, of thinking. And where, where I'm left, is I, I think it, it is critically important that whoever the, the entity is that is moving this forward, that this kind of dialogue, discussion, and process continues. I, 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 and again, I, I haven't done the analysis here uh, to, to let me say this definitively, but I, I would be amazed if your other competitors, as, as you brought up, are not making very aggressive strides and that what we're doing here has to be put in that in that broader context and that it, it really is critically important that the men, momentum that is, is started in a session like this uh, continues on and that we have some of the framework to, to maintain that, that, uh, that orientation. So I don't know, uh, Elizabeth, do you have any sort of concluding thoughts or any uh, ideas on wrapping things up? Parting thoughts, I just want to reinforce what everyone else had said, I don't want to repeat it. Um, I do think we need to be mindful that as excited as we are about the growth and whether we, some of us think we're on that fork of uplift or down, um, we have had single digit growth for Estes, which we are so extremely thankful for and excited about, but our competition has had double digit growth. That's what this looks like. So what I worry about is five years from now, our 8% growth has gone down every year. From like next year, maybe we'll be 7%, and the following year we'll be six. Five, four, three, two, one. We've been there before, so I feel very close to that scenario. Um, as Bill stated just four years ago, we were looking at that type of challenge and we weren't even sure how to deal with it. Um, I think this level of optimism in the room is fantastic because this is the type of energy that is going to launch our future of destination product development or whatever, however you want to term it. It can be termed in other um, phrases if our community is more comfortable with that. But I think we're talking about investing in our future 
beyond what the associations, which are completely volunteer based, are able to do, and certainly beyond what the town board can do on their own. I think it's easy for some members of our community to say it's the town's responsibility. Well, we're quite aware that the town has a massive challenge to overcome the infrastructure that was damaged post-flood, so it's not just their responsibility. And certainly Visit Estes Park, yes, we're the marketing arm of the community, but if there's opportunity for us to rise up and lend some support to this opportunity and partner with the EDC and their um, funding strength as well and their talents, and then also partner with the town, um, that's the end goal. Um, I, just, I just don't want us to, I'm, I'm glad we're all optimistic, and I am too, um, but I do think if we put this on hold because we're all feeling good, that's when the wheels come off, and that's what Mitch cites. Um, happens time and time again. It's easy for us to just sit back and wait for it to be a problem, but I think um, our board with Visit Estes and our staff feel that we want to stay ahead of this. So let's celebrate our growth, agree. I think we will continue to grow, um, but other communities have double-digit growth. How did they get there? They got there through this type of process. Um, final thought of the day is um, there is land available in this community. Um, Epic is struggling with funding. Um, Elkhorn Project or Elkhorn Lodge is struggling. It's been for sale for a long time. There's no way Estes Valley Partners for Commerce or ELA or the town or even the EDC can solve that problem. I see the, the solution being this type of forum to solve, the, solve those challenges and opportunities. There's plenty of land in this town. There's 68 acres owned privately within the LMD district that's kind of sitting on hold because the private people that own it are waiting for this destination product development opportunity to take off. They don't want to do it too early. But, you know, I, ELA can't get them excited. The town board can't get them excited. And frankly, the EDC can't either. But something with this type of forum and focus can get them excited. And that's what ignites this opportunity. So enough of my soapbox. I just want to thank everyone for being here today. I can't tell you how thrilled our board and our staff were of um, the amount of turnout we had. And thank you so much, Town Board, for devoting this much time out of your busy schedules. We really appreciate it. Town staff as well, Economic Development Board and members, Visit Estes Park, and the community. I think we all feel really great about where we are now. And there is more help. You know, this isn't a one and done thing. We. Um, hope to work with Mitch in the future if this community decides to move this process forward. Visit Estes Park is happy to invest in this process in partnership with the community. So um, let's keep the discussions going and, and look at solutions. I think most of you that know me, I'm a results-oriented person, so we're not going to just sit on this information. We're going to do something with it, even if it's just baby steps. You know, the paddle boards on Lake Estes, I won't stop talking about because <laughs> That's what this looks like. Those little wins are huge for this destination. So let's keep working together and just give yourselves a round of applause for being here. Thank you so much.